सर गुड मॉर्निंग या गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग so good morning uh, to all the participants uh, so we are in day 3 of our gyan course and uh, as we know yesterday uh, uh, professor burney has sent me late night the slides today morning i have emailed it to all the participants so please note uh, that uh, professor burney's uh, uh, lecture today the session today will be at 2 pm india time because he will be starting in the morning so it will be 2 pm india time so it is different from yesterday so today and tomorrow it will be 2 pm india time and we'll as usual good morning uh, to all the participants there is an echo uh, here so, so we are in day 3 of our gyan course and uh, as we know yesterday uh, uh, professor burr yeah so it is being live stream so this i have the problem with that so it is from my pc itself which gets live stream so anyway i have set up the stream for people to see so what we were trying to say is here we let us see with regard to this uh, our idea for the course as it is progressing we are half way through so this is uh, day 3 my own session so i am in my third session here uh, but we would like to also you to tell you that as professor burney has told yesterday that the mathematical parts are over so now today onwards if you see his slide if you got some time to go through his slides so today onwards it would be more of uh, more of application oriented so it will be so we will try to go hand and hand in hand i have tried to balance the course such that we go hand in hand so Uh, again, I am going through my outline presentation to quickly tell what exactly we have been doing. So, Professor Burney, as we know, was mathematical preliminaries here, day one. Yesterday, he spoke on heavy mathematics. So, what we got, he took some examples of histogram, first order statistics. He defined a security margin here. So, those probability distribution between an attacker and a defender, we try to see yesterday. So, I will tell you, try to tell you this in my uh, G A N GAN. because we have this confusion gian and gan gan so that i'll try to tell so this is from ad, uh, from adversary and defender point of view today he is trying to uh, find out and tell us about say, the examples in the machine and deep learning so today we are going to hear this from professor burney at 2 pm and here i'll try to go this is over from my side here we have uh, he will be extending here today and we are trying to see some examples we have uh, we will see try to see mnist example cats and dogs examples today try to see it as far as possible today and here as we see it's an active researcher i have been telling uh, right throughout my course 
and here this is how we met professor bernie and he is that's why we are very thankful to gyan office for uh, uh, gyan mhrd for sponsoring this particular activity and uh, they have been very supportive and our institute also has been very supportive in our department this is i think the fourth gyan course which is taking place so uh, earlier gyan courses we have had uh, experts from uk so we have experts from south korea who have been joining us us who have been joining us so this is uh, a course from uh, middle of europe that is italy so again these are my students who are part of this course and who have helped us so bibash abrant monali swayam smruti ojasvi ayush and jayan so let's go quickly we will not uh, put much time on this i have been doing this uh, right from beginning let's concentrate here on our part what exactly is our collab sessions but before that before we go to collab sessions we would like to go and take one more view of cnn because today we are going to cover cnns with regard to uh, our collab session so in order to understand cnns we need to know its architecture because uh, it, uh, if we do not know its theory behind it though we know how cnn is formed in yesterday's uh, class i have told you the how cnn forms right from basic concept of electronics where the mask is slid across an image and then what happens is computation of uh, the dot product whatever i told you yesterday uh, then that is a feature map technically then we pool so all that i have told that we'll see today but in addition to that there are some things which i haven't told because i did not want to make it very heavy on day 1 because uh, for many of the participants convolution itself will be will be new for those who know it's well and good that itself will be new and on top of that telling so many things about cnn becomes boring so we'll try to balance this because this course have been doing for several <clears throat> talks at our own institute we have been doing so we see the average participant understanding and then we try to balance this course so that everybody understands so here let us try to go ahead with this part so it's an important part here what we are trying to look so i'll annotate this particular pdf uh, this particular ppt and we'll try to understand as far as possible what are the concepts uh, which so that we get clarity on them so cnn architectures so when we say architecture here it has a different meaning generally whenever we are having homes we uh, we bring uh, we bring an architect into picture who gives us the design so the same concept applies here that's what i am trying to tell you here the same things whatever in real life are there the same thing applies here so when we say architect it's he is different from an engineer right so the engineer generally when he builds a house he is focused on making the columns right the slab right the walls right etc what is the role of the architect the architect gives you the broader picture so he or she tells you how exactly the layout should be where exactly the room should be aesthetics how it it should be accordingly the civil engineer tries to do the job similar thing is here so cnn architect cnn we already know from yesterday's uh, class we have learned that <clears throat> it's a convolution neural network lot of convolution max pooling layers are available this much if you know it's done so later we will try to know today's class we will try to learn its architectures and then we will try to go into the collab sessions because if i directly jump into collab sessions you may not appreciate this so i in 45 minutes i'll try to be brief because majority of the thing is being covered in our earlier class we'll try to be brief but if i do not do this it will be uh, it will be simple collab sessions which do not uh, convey much meaning because uh, it will not be theoretically correct so coming to what are these cnn again the deep learning book ian goodfellow's book is a uh, one which is standard so you could refer that so i have told you about the history yesterday so here uh, yeah. i request the participants to put themselves on yeah, mute yeah, yeah, yeah. participants please put yourself on mute yeah so i have told you about the history of deep convolution networks but i told only about uh, likun so please understand that i have only to, uh, told about likun so i have not told about the other history so likun's achievements yesterday i have told you when i discussed when i discussed about the linet whatever we had uh, uh, seen and what he is doing now so but actually the convolution networks actual foundation went into neural networks because the uh, original perceptron which we covered on day 1 of gyan course that particular uh, concept was invented by rosenblatt in 1950s so this was what were we referred as the area of ai so artificial intelligence whenever we did it was perceptron and simple example of perceptron i have applied to a non linear problem of 
non-linear problem of this XOR gate, where we cannot solve it using uh, directly. We take the help of two lines. Those two lines itself are hidden layers, right? So that is where the computation of weights is happening. So there is where I told, and I modeled perceptron similar to a similar to a human brain. So this is what is human brain does. So that is why please say that any and every machine is can be defeated by a human human being because human brain is the best pr human brain whatever we have is the best pattern recognition system best pr system so the best pattern recognition system is human brain so that you should always know and we want to make the best human brain uh, we want to transfer this knowledge to the machine so that's our job so 1950s this neural networks came perceptron i have told you on day one then in 80s and 90s it became more popular uh, and people started using it here and there for several tasks i told you the examples of robots coming into picture i told gave you examples of maruti suzuki's workshop coming into picture so all these things i have told you we won't go into this because our focus is something else today going into cnn's architecture then i told you lee kun did this he was the first person who could, who trained a convolution neural network which is the primary idea today also even in 2022 we are trying to do whatever lee kun did in 1998 so late 90s lee kun did and we will see lee kun's network today and uh, he tried as we know that he yesterday i have spoken about lee kun's achievements that he was not recognized till 2012 but in between lee kun was not the other person after lee kun also there were several people around 2008 2010 everybody were trying to tell yes convolution neural network can be done but people were not accepting till till what you came till uh, the 10 to 12 came right so 2000s these were the people who tried to do something related to uh, deep networks but nobody gave them uh, much attention or traction or acclaim so in the vision community they were not recognized just like lee kun was not recognized all these people also were not recognized much right so the substantial progress was not made uh, uh, be, like because these neural network en engineers uh, were saying that hand crafting is the best so for them the hand crafting approach till 2010 2011 where domain specific approach is there etc etc is there that itself uh, was right but the uh, shock happened here in 2012 where the, all these people hand crafted people lost the challenge so yesterday i have shown you the challenge isl vrc challenge where millions of images were given and 20000 categories were asked to recognize none of the handcraft fitted features achieved accuracy of even 60 to 65% but this uh, deep learning neural network which was likun's idea but likun did not he left it so the later part people who used that that particular idea of cnn broke that performance and said that they got around 95% accuracy but it did it had a drawback that it take uh, it has taken lot of computation time so that was the shock that happened here so uh, this is see this is how lee uh, lee kun started so lee kun's network is called lee net so this from lee from the person this is the lee name net means network okay and whenever I, uh, any number is affixed lee net 5 that means that amount of layers that amount of layers so here linet try to do what linet try to do uh, training on or testing on in 1998 please recollect on this data set m n i s t so we look about this data set so yesterday and day before yesterday we have looked into data set called iris flower petal easiest data set but we will try to make it little bit more complex now by going into this m n i s t data set which is nothing but a hand written digit recognition from only 0 till 9 So zero, one, two, three, nine. In different ways, you write, and then you train to recognize any of these numbers. So Lee Kun, when he did in 1998, he said that he took a he took an image of these letters, right? And he took this as 32 cross 32. The size of the image, gray level image, was 32 cross 32, and he passed through the convolution layers. So as soon as he passed through the convolution layers, you are going to get a feature map. You are going to get a feature map. so here he used 28 this is the image to this he resized it to 28 28 then he six filters he used so he got like this feature maps then he went into sub sampling so this we have done and please note i think yesterday one of our participants asked us why only max pooling why not average pooling linet used average pooling 
because at that point average pooling was good that you just take everything yeah. average it out and you just find out so that was what was being done so leenet were uh, lee kun tried to do this average pooling so the uh, sub sampling was average pooling he repeated this convolution sub sampling convolution sub sampling like this so five layers were formed so this is how the five layers were formed so leenet five and then it was fully connected so full connections for classifications and here the output was obtained so now whatever we call the architecture cnn architecture this entire part of the, from the input up till the output is called a cnn architecture it is called a cnn architecture so here this is the architecture if i want to tell more about architecture the first thing that you will ask me is sir how many how many layers right so here the number is affixed so leenet when he tried to do this in 1998 with his seminal paper here which i am going to show here this is the part here and it is 1998 if you could see it's a 1998 paper so here he tried to do what here he tried to use all these concepts whatever we know today from you know, from that day and uh, of course he was not alone he had a group of researchers who were working with him so bottu wingo and hafner and all of this so he tried to apply it to this by using cnn but he did not call directly convolution neural network he used some other way that learning applied to document recognition so the name was different but the idea was same so as i told importance and it was neglected by the vision community so here leenet tried to do this the same thing instead of taking here in this fashion i have taken down in a better fashion see here 28 cross 28 inputs are there the size of the image is 28 cross 28 it is mnist data set then one means one means what it is a it is a gray level image if it is 3 then it is rgb so then we tried to pass through these uh, filters and one of our participants i think dr vishnath was asking me about padding so earlier when you do convolution do you require padding or not uh, so we are going into details now yes so he padded so he padded but now those things are gone off because uh, he was a conventional researcher who was who knew about edge detection etc so padding he wanted so it was padded up so here you see padding means at the ends you are going to fill with some numbers so that when the sliding happens you don't get some wrong results so padding is essential so he padded this he used 32 filters went through all this so 28 cross 22 to cross 32 feature map he got okay stride see he he did not use one he stride he used stride two and see pooling he did average pooling 2 cross 2 then these numbers goes down as soon as you sub sample via pooling 28 28 become 14 14 right then again you go again you took 64 filters the next convolution layer so this was the first convolution layer this was the pooling so i am writing con this is con here then it was a pool right so it was pool here so after pool one more one more con here this is convolution so you see this this is your convolution here then you again have a pool right so you have pool here so look at this particular leenet file so here one then it is two like this there is three so here you could see there are three then there is again a con here okay again a con here again a pool here so i won't write again again a con there is no more pool then there is a two layers called flattening and dropout so fc means fully connected fully connected means it is flattened to fully connected i have shown yesterday how it is fully connected dropout means it's a concept dropout is a concept again used for optimization so you get some accuracy you say that okay accuracy is good can i uh, time is very large so can i reduce it can i reduce it if answer is yes i can reduce the time so they drop out some samples randomly they drop out that drop out rule is there they drop out some samples again run the see and see how much accuracy if accuracy is not significantly uh, increase means decreasing then they go for a drop out but it decreases the time so it's a trade off between uh, getting good and uh, good results versus time taken to do the trick okay so time taken i think there is some again disturbance participants please put yourself on mute so uh, i think i request the other administrator to mute the participants 
yeah so here these are the flattening features which we get and we finally we get output so why it is the output here you see why it is 10 could anybody tell me in chat box why it is 10 why it is 10 anybody in the chat box no it is digits sir that is why right as uh, he said it's a digits mnist dataset here M mnist dataset here is digits from 0 1 2 till 9 so this is the dataset 0 till 9 so there are 10 numbers there are 10 record there are 10 classes so uh, i'll not write as numbers while write there are 10 classes so this 10 classes recognition is the task so here your output is 10 classes so here it will say class 1 is 0 class 1 is i'll show you today in our uh, uh, this gulab this our collab session one like this you go here up till 9 so here 10 classes are there here 10 classes are there so please see this is the simplest network i think i have somebody who said that you are not getting my voice is my voice not audible to i think uh, uh, dr gupta is my voice audible i'm sorry if you are not getting yeah, my voice very much okay maybe is having problem with his uh, speaker okay, uh, okay great, great right right so i think if you have some issue dr gupta i think you can also see the youtube part huh? i am very sorry for this so if you are not able to hear please reconnect and you could hear so so what we do try to say here is see this linet let us forget now actually now we have google's network which is uh, 120 layers see see the, see where we start today we are where 120 but leave today go back because if you understand basic prod properly then we can go on building many things so today what your google gmail does etc does 120 layers huh? 120 layers so it has 120 so let us forget all that let us go to what linet did so his input here let us go back so here as we see here so you have this this 1 2 3 1998 1, 2, he was trying to give this 1 2 3 examples right 0 1 2 3 10 classes so this is how he started training so this is see this is layer 1 so this is i'll just write layer 1 then this is i have convolution and pool layer 2 then one more convolution and layer pool this layer 3 then you have this layer 4 here right and you see at last he does not have he has convolution he has convolution but he does not have pool he does not have pool he did not feel there it is pool so if you can ask me you can stop me here and ask me sir how you decide that whether pool should be there or not so this is again uh, on a data set you go on executing on data set go on that is what your machine learning engineers do they keep it for training they go on observing so these five layers is known as linet five li for likun net for this is network that is why see it looks very nice na this 3d it looks it is called an architecture so the word architecture comes from here are we clear with this okay and last see you don't require any classifier here your dropout and flattening flattening that itself will do classification so it is independent so cnn and classifier come together right so it is just like like package so you suppose you are going i'll give example which i always give in my classes whenever i take these classes you go to some hotel right as uh, suppose you go nowadays we do not go because of covid but when we go to a hotel you look at a package deal right so you say three nights four days uh breakfast included lunch included everything then that would be cheaper and it would work out to both parties both our uh, the person who is booking as well as the restaurant because they are guaranteed that these people will take their meals here so they will reduce their cost they will reduce their cost right so that would be cheaper yeah, against going out and coming back and again maybe you may get some food or not proper food we don't know right so here we are trying to see it's a package it's a package that you are having layers of convolution pool convolution pool then you have your classifier also within this so what we do here in our traditional learning what we do we take all these people we take all these people and we call this hand crafting so we extract some edges shift or some shape this shape quadri this quaternion this is all of us did it a very early days when we were doing we did all that so this is called hand craft feature extraction so this i was we were doing feature extraction so feature extraction we were doing so this feature extraction is is being done now also 
right but it is not being done in the sense that it is done in a box convolution is doing this so we don't know want to know we can apply it to any problem you can apply it to your digits you can apply it to image you can apply it to petal sepal numbers you can apply it to share prices you can apply it to text the domain at all feature extraction happens classification after this traditionally we did here svm we brought somebody here and we told that this is classifier so classifier we put this classifier here together in this particular part we put the classifier so here it is not like this here it is not like this everything comes as a whole your feature extraction and classifier together it comes use then use so this is also referred as nowadays model so cnn model it is also so this model na is a model which does all your job of feature extraction and classification and gives you the output so so many people have this complaint that sir i cannot understand uh, this cnn there is no control in our traditional hand crafting we can control here we cannot control i am we get this even i used to say this right that how to when we were new to this net with this we were saying that how do you control this but when we go into deep of this means depth of this that okay cnn means what how it convolves how numbers are coming there still i can control how i can control i can change my filters i can change my filters here i can change my i can have some padding do not have padding i can observe the accuracy i can uh, i can do what i can go on uh, doing average pulling i can do max pulling xc which goes good right then i can go on repeating lee found for 5 it was good how did lee come at this 5 number with experiments running it simulations again and again he came up with this number so i also can do it here so such kind of things we also can do but acceptability was little bit difficult even for us see i am not from the deep learning era i am from the traditional era where we were doing hand crafting so when I, when initially somebody told this we were trying to understand for us also that there was how do we control this so but now when we have done some work on this our students have worked i myself have trained few networks then we know how to control right so the, this knowledge of mine i am passing it to wherever i give a talk or in my class or any participants whenever i am trying to say that don't go and see very large networks right go just like see i want to teach digital electronics assume so how do i teach digital i, I don't teach marks and all first right i i teach a half adder then i say i teach a full adder then i say it's a multiplexer made up of adders subtractor can be made up of adders so that is how i go the same principle please apply in machine learning do not go directly to the highest part that this particular part is easy or it, it becomes difficult if you go and read advanced stuff so do not go advanced stuff keep things simple in your life that you try to understand how it formed so these were the people who formed it then we try to look into how things moved ahead so with this i think i can see a chat here if there is uh yeah third dimension is for filter in this architecture yeah third dimension is filter in this architecture because uh, third dimension here is one because it's a grayscale image it's a it's a grayscale image one is a grayscale so no one words 32 or whatever he says 64 and all this these are this and whatever this number comes na i am not multiplying this whatever this number comes whatever this big number comes they are called hyper parameters and we are controlling as designers hyper parameters so we want to do what we want to do the hyper parameter control that's what we are trying to do okay so i think this is there for us so any doubts here i'll just escape this and i'll discard this and ask you people if there is any i can stop sharing my screen because we want to get clarity on my basic part so if that is not there then it becomes difficult for anybody to understand so i'll just uh, selection of filter for each layer how no, uh, Uh, to select so okay selection of uh, selection of can you repeat uh, uh, filters in each layer after we pull and then we'll go to another convolution there how to select the filter yeah uh, there we require a little bit of domain i got your question so how the filter selection is the question by uh, dr vishwanath here so the filter selection is again dependent slightly dependent on the problem so what is the problem whether it is a text recognition whether it is a computer vision problem whether it is applied to time series data so there the choice of filters there are standard filters which we are use just like previt 
Sobel and uh, for image prism people we know Privet, we know Sobel, we know Laplacian, we know Gaussian, all these people we know. No, the so edge is the important parameter there. Yeah, yeah. So, so where edge is the parameter there. So little bit of domain knowledge comes from the filters. So machine learning engineers know these particular filters. Mm -hmm. So I think there is any other question. I think there is one more question here. Are these, yeah, yeah. Ankan, yes, this is a 32 cross 32 filter. That is right. Okay. So that is what is right. Okay. So I think we'll again share back our screen and go back to our uh, stuff, what we are trying to understand. Because here, if this is clear, well, I'll discard the ink annotations. So here we'll go back here and we'll see. So let's see, this is what is MNIST data set. I'm going to the Colab notebook here. This is what is, so as our participant, Dr. Vishwanath told us, these are numbers. So here again, I am putting the same, these are numbers, right? So here is the size of this. So here rows, na, different varieties of zeros and ones, how you write rows. So just a description of this data set or database, it has 60,000 examples and total 70,000. In this, we give 60,000. I have again told you not a thumb rules. Follow thumb rules, 80 to 20. 60,000 we give for training uh, and 10,000 we give it for testing, right? So this particular and this all these images are 28 cross 28. Because you may ask me, sir, why this is 28, 28? Nowadays, real life images you only have told in your class are not 28, 28. Yes, I only, I have told what is the actual size. Nowadays, you are having 1024, 1024. So nowadays you do not have 28, 28 or 128, one, you don't have this, but I will come to this little bit later. Again, it is our training time, how much time it takes. So, uh, so those things I'll come to it a little bit later when we go into uh, the data set and I'll show you, I'll execute today one of the notebooks and show you, but now we want to understand what is this MNIST. MNIST means, I'll just give you the definition also. It's a national, it's a US standard, National Institute of Standard. This, this acronym is there. I'll go when we go to the notebook. So it is from NIST. So NIST is a US based this. So it's a standard data set. So if you use MNIST, you can do your experiments. Many people would have, see why we go towards standard data sets. We go towards standard data sets because there would have been people, researchers who would already have been uh, using this data set producing some results here and there, and it is easy to compare. So if you do your own data sets, then you don't have a benchmark. Then the community, when I say community, the uh, research community do not recognize these results, say that how, how do you know you're not shared your data set. So the first task is while doing any research, kindly take standard data sets and run your example, run your algorithms or models. Nowadays models, everybody, nobody use algorithms. Right? Nowadays everybody say model. Run your models on this, get better to do on your own data set. You want to test, do it. Similar way I have done during my PhD, I use standard data sets. But uh, when I wanted to convince my supervisor that it works, I showed him my real data set. Right? And again, I try to make that data set common by, use, by keeping on my web page and people are using that now. So that's how the community uh, grows. So here we are talking about this MNIST data set. This is what Lee Kun used. So Lee Kun used this particular data set uh, several years uh, back. So here, uh, so let's go, let's forget Lee Kun, five layer network easiest. So we'll see, we'll execute that today, but let's fast forward this to this, to this, uh, this particular class, which I showed yesterday. ISL international, this BRC challenge. So every year this happens, huh? now also this year also it happens. Nowadays the winners are Google, Google net inception it is called. So inception is the winner now. If you go to see the network, we'll not understand anything, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is in 2012, in 2012, we are fast forwarding to the arrival of big visual data. So we are getting 20,000. I have talked about this yesterday. I don't want to talk again. We are getting these 20,000 classes, not 10 classes like Lee Kun. And we are having millions of images. And these images are gathered from internet, right? And this challenge is thrown and uh, this challenge is thrown and who wins is the best network. So convolution neural network uh, proposed uh, by one person when we go now next, we are going to his network won this challenge. This 2012 challenge was won by one more person, not by Lee Kun. Lee Kun just was defeated. So he said, I'll forget it, right? So let's go to that this 
so we are, we are going to the winner of isl vrc 2012 winner it was a person called alex alex wilson is a russian here so he was the person who won this challenge and he was the person who right i think there is again disturbance so here again the uh, we are going to this that uh, we are uh, we are going to this that this particular data set so here the data set was so big the data set was millions so i am writing mn millions omni classes 20000 classes recognition problem everybody failed but this person alex i, I don't know how to spell or pronounce this so this person so won this particular challenge these three people and this is in 2012 nips it's a most difficult to come conference to crack nips right image net classific image net is the name of the data set so what is image net this is image net so the data set is called image net it is available online huh? you can you can take this data set and you can millions of images you can take and you can also train but i'll tell you how to, how to easily not take this data set and you reuse this i'll tell you that in the collab notebook so here we are going to this person's net alex so it is alex network which won this this person had this so he used max pooling he used a non linearity after the max pooling he called it the uh, relu so i'll talk about that right he used the seven hidden layers so alex net used seven hidden layers 650000 units 60 million hyperparameters so we are not in a position to go across what and all he did here right he did so many things and finally he could recognize this he trained see here trained on two gpus two graphic processing unit for a week and he used a dropout condition so here also what was there convolution max pool convolution max pool convolution max pool he went on doing this seven times he went on doing this seven times and multiplication when that you multiply all these and you get all these uh, hyper parameters whatever i told filters whatever you go back here whatever i told here all these filters when you multiply whatever results you get out of this multiplication all that if you add up then you get these many millions of hyper parameters which he tuned and it could not run on a cpu he used two gpus parallelly he used speed up 50 times speed up more than cpu he did he used this uh, means he means this sort of uh, this group used this he dropped out something at the last layer drop out because it was not much affecting the accuracy you can go through his uh, paper in detail those interested people can go through image net classification it's a nip standard paper i think more than 20000 citations for single paper okay so this is what happened in 2012 he was the ias ils vrc 2012 winner alex net and this was lee's uh, framework was same as lee net so how was framework similar uh, convolution pool convolution pool then drop out that concept was similar okay that concept was same but you had more data you had more data and he found that seven layers are sufficient and it gave that that much accuracy details you can go into alex net so alex net was the win winner image net was the challenge so image net is the database and isl vrc was the challenge which was one so we should make we should make the things clear now and here he could output 1000 classes easily he could tell this is cat tiger this is if you go behind me there is a tv okay here there is a there is a bottle here there is a phone here there is a spectacle everything 10000 10000 classes he could see he could give by this particular convolution so this is how alex net one right in this so, so this was what uh, happened uh, this was what was the top 5 in this on this uh, in 2012 and 2013 uh, results so they uh, put the error how much error they got alex so all of these people participated who are the people who participated new york university then you have this uh, oxford zizerman uh, this vgg group you had this uh, this uh, this google group so all of this participated but image net was won by this russian here alex net so this this was continued for all years this was continued for all years here right so this is what was the average this was again alex net topology what i am showing network model whatever you call 
so so many weights 60 million hyper weights it was learning i have shown you simple perceptron learning three weights what is this three when going to movie right so that uh, back propagation i have told you so here you see here you have millions of weights so it is a complex network and nowadays so here this is the just a snapshot of the paper here it looks something like this so you could download this interested people can go today and download image net classification with deep convolution neural network alex kurelski and you can go through this and you can see what i am trying to say it has many details so we are not going into the details so now why do we want seven layers what is deep what is the word deep right that we are going to come so let's go here and let's go back here to our uh, simple network so if if this linet was say 3 or linet was 5 layers or still say 6 7 still it is considered to be some opposite of deep which is called shallow so when i see this network now na in 22 i will say this alexnet is a shallow network shallow network why i will say for but that time for them it was deep can anybody tell why can anybody tell me why it was at that time deep now i am telling it shallow no because of the computing power yeah right as he rightly said dude that time na no, computing power was very less even putting this much to to he saw na no, how many weeks i don't i'm very bad in remembering things so whatever weeks he told na no, what is this slide i have uh, two weeks uh, trained on for one week two gpu one week so if you use one gpu will take two weeks simple math that i apply right so what i'm trying to say here is computing at that time was less so that time this was deep for them now it is not like that see you are given free collab you can train test right google is giving you for free so it was shallow now now it is shallow but that time it is deep so now we have to talk about 2022 21 22 now deep layer, layer networks are uh, more than 15 and now it has gone to around 120 layers imagine how many people will be required to train test what is the computing power it it runs generally on hpcs okay so i'll talk about that very quickly here but we want to get the essence of what we are trying to say so see this is what was uh, alexnet so for us what are the benchmarks linet alexnet you know this much you know everything in cosn okay so here why convolution network should be deep so deep is if it is more deep it is learned that it is going to learn more and more features so let us come to traditional uh, handcrafting which people know initial na no? initial when you are going into first layer second layer here as one of our participant vishwanath is trying to say here you are trying to learn edges if it is image ha huh? edges here you are going to learn i am just giving it is not necessary even i don't know what it will learn right what it will learn even i am just giving a broad idea when we i have plotted this and seen at each level what happens i have given some images i want i saw this out of curiosity out of curiosity i saw i wanted i come from the from the previous world of hand crafting so i wanted to see what this output of this layer is then it was going as a broad level features were getting then we were getting little bit middle level feature features so middle level features we were getting here right this middle level so edges was this very this then you getting middle then you are getting generalized features here at the last layer general and they are not working independently together they work so you cannot say that initially only i'll get a general feature no right so whatever you learned is shift surf edge all this here also it is like that but they are not named we don't need to worry but initially if you see it learns low level features then it learns middle level features then it learns high level features and here it gives me the output softmax means it gives the classification so here this is the classification block so i am writing here this is the classification block okay and here you are having the convolution block or this is the feature we should feature extraction so i should not be calling these names huh? i am wrong if i call these names but i have to make you understand with the earlier knowledge so i am calling this is feature extraction this is class right so here this is what is convolution neural network here so now what happens so the you just see this is what happened you use seven layers you get this 
whatever accuracy here accuracy is measured in terms of er error okay so you got this much whatever numbers of errors you got then if you left this you removed some layers you say why so that's what we do as machine learning engineers we subtract some layer add some layers so only four layers your you got 33.5% drop in accuracy so depth of the network is the key so deep so we should but not for all if data set is simple use two three layers it works fine so for this iris data set uh, petal data set fine no no issue right but if you want to understand uh, google want to understand what i am mailing to say uh, one of the participant navin kumar or padmavati madam or vishwanath sir what they i what we are ex lot of data big data then depth is the key right so are we getting this so if i subtract out these three four five layers there is a drop in uh, accuracy in performance we accuracy and error are inverse that minus this so when i say accuracy or error it is minus so, so there is a drop in performance here so why it should be deep is why alexnet one this is the architecture again i am going through alexnet so alexnet here convolution pool convolution pool norm means this is norm right then, uh, then again see here no pool so here see so no pool so it is not necessary that you should pull but convolution is necessary then again he is pulling how we came up with this he came up like this by doing this dropping pulling and seeing because why he will add extra things when it will work correctly why he will do that he will not do that right so he want to keep it as training wise as simple as possible fully connected also he used three layers fully connected c 7 8 right so this becomes alexnet example here alexnet uh, became the uh, this winner of this so now now let us come to pre because i want to go into google collab so i am already 1017 so i want to go into let's come to let's fast forward again right then isl vrc then isl vrc went ahead to after 12 13 14 15 16 now i don't know what is the result but you know now this after that alexnet did not win alexnet did not win can you tell anybody why alexnet did not win later just out of curiosity it is non technical answer is non technical i am just out of curiosity i am asking you why may have alexnet not have won later apparently other people will be trying with various other architectures yeah he may be concentrated with this architecture parallelly what was the result uh, they will be focusing towards that okay. maybe okay. Uh, in my view that may be the reason yeah we are getting one of the views that uh, there are other people who are trying very hard yes that is one of the ways because once somebody publishes other people start that's right what he says he is a researcher he knows the field anybody else i want to get some participation here from my participants anybody else who would think that why why alexnet could not win later nobody i think i have one on chat uh, uh, number of hyper parameters okay because of the number of hyper parameters or uh, the answer lies here on my screen down look at these names uh, this this at least i think you understand this person google at least you understand L let us forget resnet and all let go to google you would get this word google so why alexnet could not have won again anybody by seeing this name at least you can tell me but what uh, dr vishwanath has said is perfectly right other people are trying yes that is correct so can you add something more to that other people trying so that we get to the answer why alexnet or some simple researchers like me or so if it was me it would be mannet if it was dr vishwanath vishwanath net so why people like mannet and vishnath red could cannot win now or nowadays nobody now to simplify the, the other architecture and then maybe uh, the others are uh, highly intelligent compared to the people who have already worked out okay okay i'll give you this answer it is very funny answer yeah it is very funny answer adding to what he is trying to say uh, see this is now it is not the question of intelligence see the intelligence is yes all of us 
our average intelligent lee kun nobody believed when he was trying to do then later when alex net did and showed for this it won so alex net is not actually the idea lee kun is the person the reason is after that why alex net could not win or why man net doesn't win etc is the amount of money pumped into by these uh, commercial companies okay the amount of computing power that you have you go here and see what i'm trying to say the amount i i don't have in my lab also i don't have all this right i don't have all these kind of gpus right uh, i don't have these gpus or tpus now it is tensor processing units i don't have uh, yes i am uh, hod computer center as a institute i have right but on my lab i don't have this i don't have such such high and when i am giving it to institute it is shareable resource right so i i cannot get that the gpu is dedicated to me but this google net oxford this uh, uh, facebook they have lot of millions of rupees put across in their uh, companies where they have their own their own paper things right so they have what they have their own resources lot of money being pumped into okay so what i am trying to say here is lot of money is being pumped into this field because uh, see facebook now you tag face it tags it tells you are you this person you open whatsapp whatsapp is again taken over by facebook right you open that and you see so it tells you it uh, you tell hello how are you after you say how then the two things come are you how it came how it came because uh, these networks see i couldn't fit it you will not understand anything in this see this is google's network so it is 120 layers right here something you can see this vgg is vgg group by oxford this is an oxford's group professor zizerman heads this group it's university of oxford so he was in icvgip uh, i think people who attend icvgip know about andrew zizerman so it's a he's a acclaimed uh, researcher in vision zizerman's group it is so you can go to all these groups it's all there it is all there so this is google net right yeah, so now google net is over inception has come google's inception series has come then you have this resnet microsoft etc are into all these areas so we cannot universities or institutes funding cannot match the uh, industries they are very low, compute heavy so they go on putting the go on giving data they are training day and night we cannot do it but what we can do we can give the concept so what is the concept what uh, concept was given here alex net gave the concept he showed it with simple seven layers as researcher say i you or vishwanath sir we can do all this right so we can do this much we can do but we cannot do more than this right are we getting this so we can be happy with our citations but we cannot defeat we cannot defeat this nowadays machine learner or deep learners which are this big you will not be able to see at all inception layer this is lot of inception so isl we are see 20 after 2012 till now whatever happens is every time won by resnet google net with they compete and this graph is drawn for them this graph now whatever graph i have shown here this kind of graphs is drawn for them whoever is the new york university is also tough they are also doing this so what we are trying to say here is we want to go to the collab notebooks here what we have then people started developing data sets then came cipher 10 so people who know this uh not only image net cipher 10 is there consisting of 60000 color images in 10 classes right with 6000 images per class okay so there are such 15000 images and 10 so cipher 10 came cipher 100 came so there are many cipher's which are come though so bird airplane automobile deer frog horse ship all this and now you see this is the accuracy this is the models which are present there. there is a lot of disturbance with one of the participants okay so here you see vgg 16 so the number which reads 16 is what is the depth resnet 18 resnet 50 resnet 101 resnet this c then densnet 121 right so dp and this what are these are the accuracies which are hitting so you see everybody is around 95% they are just like our 10th standard 10th class 12th class students they are everybody getting 99 i don't know how right we did not get all that are we getting this so the times have changed 
so vgg net etc this is oxford group respect microsoft group google net everybody are with highest accuracy on any of these images so here we come to this this is how it started first cnn winner was alex net and i have only shown till till 2015 i have shown resnet google net one here right so this was the first cnn based winner who won earlier to this some shallow networks won but it was actually deep with seven or eight layers which was won by alexnet then the number of layers increased so now you see is nearing 152 layers goes on see the uh, this is the error error goes on reducing error goes on again you go down here we are somewhere in 2022 till date really you know i don't know i am uh, humbly accepting this today's layers i don't know very complex networks but i can reuse i'll tell how okay so this is how your deep linear uh, your network say google and this uh, this networks so we'll go quickly to this this is the revolution of depth so 152 layers we have reached so uh, understanding 7 8 layers is 5 7 8 difficult now you come to 152 with our computing power at universities we are not able to do it okay so comparing so we'll quickly go through this we are not going into all this so i told you today's thing is inception by google so inception networks we are using now vgg is the oxford group they are very good you do anything tomorrow they will solve and give you the answer right so millions of hyperparameters this is the graph of operation in uh, how much uh, this uh, computing is measured in flops floating point operations so this is the floating point this giga flops versus accuracy right so this is what so we are reaching this kind of accuracy here so here uh, so with this i think we are uh, almost done. i will not go through transfer learning because it is done for some other part so i'll do it a little bit later if time time permits or telling you about transfer learning so now comes what are my reading list this is my reading list this is my reading list now you may think that how we will train this networks will i so your natural question now which will be hitting your mind is will i take 20000 classes will i download this many million images my hard disk won't be sufficient na no? my hard disk won't be sufficient to store this how do i solve this so what i what these people have done it's the best part is let me go here so i'll go back here and show you what they are trying to do so these uh, weights so here we are going into these weights these millions of weights these neurons and weights so you can download this people so you can this is trained already trained by them on on their gpus we can use it so this is called pre trained pre trained so what i can do is instead of downloading instead of downloading say million 1 million images 1 million images what i can uh, with uh, 1 million images and storing on my hard disk i can only download these weights so i can so so this is not very very heavy so this pre trained weights which is called the hyperparameter weights what i can do is i can download only these people okay so i can download only these people here and try to do what and try to uh, and try to optimize i can reuse this so it is just i'll give you another example you have a, a us edition book which is 10000 rupees indian rupees so right so what you try to do you take that you take photostat copy of that nicely you bind it and start reading that right so in that thing what you have done is you have not spent 10000 rupees so you may have spent some 1000 or 800 rupees for doing binding etc still you have saved some large amount of money right so here also it is like this no need of downloading 1 million images data set just use these weights and these weights you can use for your own problem so if you want to if suppose people have used tiger lion right this uh, uh, phone spectacle all that and you want to do it for say your computer mouse or one small bottle etc it is already done by them right so you start using this tweak this how tweaking and all i won't tell because the time won't permit here tweak this and try to use this and put it and you see that it works fine so these are called pre trained models directly your colab notebooks 
whether it is your tensorflow libraries pytorch libraries kiras or even sk learn what we learned in our two uh, earlier uh, uh, notebooks all these pre trained are available so it will tell imagenet challenge pre trained weights use it correct so so what i'm trying to say here is it's an important part so obviously you will have this question sir millions of uh, how will i download this data set don't download this data set only download those weights and download your own little bit whatever you are training testing whatever you task you have reuse that and get your results so let's go there i am not i am not doing transfer learning now it's again a different concept let's go to the collab notebooks but before this so i'll discard my annotation i'll ask you before we go i'll stop sharing uh, here so that uh, uh, we'll and ask you if there is any issues understanding this particular concepts these are these are not very mathematically complex but they are they need some understanding and they need some thinking from your end so if you have anything please ask me so that it's almost hitting 10:30 so i had told that i'll go an hour on this particular concept so i have been on time here so let us spend some time on our notebooks so but before that we want to clarify some 3 4 minutes i'll see if there is any questions let me know so on this data set yeah yeah uh, how the geographical variability has been taken care for example uh, lion indian lion african uh, elephant so they have uh, even uh, uh, rhino african rhino rhino and indian Right, right. There are some changes. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I got your question. So the I think I am putting it to across the all the audience who are listening here. I think uh, the participant is asking, uh, say for example, not only tiger, lion. Let us take the race. So Indians look something different, right? Uh, Europeans look in a different way. U.S. people look. So you have even this race change across. So even uh, Chinese, all of them look same. Yeah. So even orientation. so i think even people who know computer vision know that if i take this phone right if i take this phone take a photo of this from this side and i take it from this side the for same photo may not the same phone may come up with two different labels because your orientation changes there so he is trying to say invariance so if i if i talk technically invariance to uh, the types so in tigers yesterday i think professor burney was also telling that some dogs are made to look like fish by the tail changing so uh, yes all these are challenges and many people have worked out i think the answer to this is transfer learning so once uh, once you understand some more concepts i think we'll be able to go there transfer learning is what we do we tweak we change our weights so i think uh, it is it is difficult to answer here what i can tell very broadly is the problem does exist whatever he has asked it is a real life problem that not all indian uh, tigers are the same way in, even in india you have different type of tigers so you have asiatic lions you have other places so how do you across this uh, how do you recognize so uh, they have tried their best to give different when you give different zeros and ones they give different styles of zeros and one like that they have trained it was this but still the problem does exist any change any tweak is an active research area and uh, they are coming up even you can come we can come up with all these uh, results and we can also solve many problems so transferability of samples is being asked i think we are going into advanced concepts we'll go that today is there tomorrow day after tomorrow three days we are going to have let's see whether we can reach there i hope it is okay yeah yeah any other questions we have before so that we that is why the accuracy yesterday you were discussing it should not be even 100% also right so right. then only we have scope for improvement scope for variability right uh, geolocation so, uh, variations etc even right. uh, accent will also change yeah yeah with speech recognition and all that yeah yeah, yeah anybody else so can we i think it's 1035 can we go to our notebooks can we start should we start yes i think we'll go with ahead with our notebooks so here uh, the major part is told so let me share the screen again so i am going to my collab sessions quick recap of what we did uh, in our uh, collab session so this is what we did see now it looks very simple na array data set 150 petal sepal right three classes So see where we are. We are in day three, and now how it looks. 
this is how life is you know this is how life is it starts simple but when it go ahead you can go on learning but the crux of the thing is if you have learned simple things it's difficult to it's easy to go in difficult concepts but if you are vice versa is not okay it's like entering your chakra view so you should uh, also know how to exit out so with this we started i'm not going into all this we did all this ensemble methods where we saw that many people are good then weak people are if you club all these weak people you get a strong classifier we did let's go to the convolution neural network let's they do what lee kun did right so let's go to this so 10 classes as uh, we knew that it is from 0 to 9 mnist so this is i always forget these names hmm. it is modified national institute of standards and technology so as i told 60 data set of 60000 training small square a 28 by pixel grayscale images of 100 digits between 0 to 9 so this is some sample i have brought it out here so this is done by monali and uh, ojasvi so this notebook so here now let's see how do we do the image class before going to notebook we'll see what we do again same concept what is the thing load take the training data set right so we have seen yesterday directly import so first step would be import then load the training and testing uh, data set so here earlier you were loading iris here you are going to load mnist so what is this mnist modified national institute of standard and technology right then what you have to do then you are going to give earlier what you are doing you are giving it to you are splitting it to 80 10 right here also you are going to split that is what uh, you are doing this 60000 you have 20000 for test because it's an 80000 this you are going to train but you are not training you are going to write a model or cnn network to do this so you are not doing it via directly going to give it to a classifier like we gave earlier like decision tree etc no we learned about cnn so we are going to give cnn so during training so during training whenever training is happening across training so once training should be complete no it's not that i feel that and it gives me result answer is no it takes as we saw in the earlier slide one week using two gpus are we getting this one week two gpus right or vice versa five gpus less than that that so you have to train and once your training is over then only you can give unknown inputs for testing that's the logic of classification so for training we are using we require mean square error i think i told you for back propagation here we are using cross entropy loss please mark my words professor burney was telling you about this and i think you remember me interrupting him and i told him that i am we are going to use entropy i think few participants who were glued throughout the workshop can uh, uh, understand what i am trying to say he was trying to say minus summation px log qx see probability distribution everything is probability and statistics in machine learning in electronics everything so our uh, parents are math math though we are engineers our parents are math though we may not understand that much math but we are engineers will use math so here true true probability distribution and models probability distribution so once we do this this is a loss so this is called cross entropy loss why it is called cross entropy because px is 1 qx is 1 there are two probabilities here p and q px qx and it is going across all classes it is going across all classes so this is cross entropy loss directly available again i told you na our friends are nowadays very good the, all these libraries are directly there but we should understand this math we should understand this math which professor burney was also telling in our earlier part this entropy these are again p and q he told kullback libler distance that we are not using currently here but for training we require a loss function here there are many eight or 10 loss functions now we are using cross entropy loss after this we test our model against the testing data set and testing data set should not be shown during training that thumb rule you have to keep then you are going to check accuracy or your whatever uh, confusion matrix right then you can also uh, give a different image random hand written digit not only their data set what you did you took mnist data set split it into 80 20 and then try to do train using cross entropy loss when entropy loss became very small you stopped then your your network is ready or model is ready then you fed some 20% which you did not show there it gave you some answer so then you measured accuracy now you may even i i may have one question from one of the participants sir why only that is that is handwritten no? i'll also write 
zero to nine some numbers and give. Will your uh, will your model work? The answer is yes. So we also test in our notebook. We also show that we can test our model against a random and return digit. That we are going to see today. Okay. So now again, same thing. So this is my model or my architecture. So you, uh, now my task is MNIST. So I take twenty two twenty two. So somebody people had this. What is this thirty two filters? Now we're going to do, do this. What is kernel size? Tried. What is this ReLU? All this we are going to understand. Okay. And after this, what are this con this con max pool con max pool here? And this is flatten which is doing the classification. And here I am having my ten classes zero to ten. See, it is so easy. If you have learned, if you have started from nine thirty and you have not moved across anywhere, and if you are listening to me properly, then you know everything. And you know one for MNIST, you know everything in in machine learning, right? Next time when I explain, you say I know this anyway. right but for the people who are listening for the first time for them it is new are we getting this point so here this is what we do so let's go and this uh, go towards this i'll discard my annotation go towards my notebook so here mnist model is here i am having github i am having this done by my students here so what i'll try to do is i am having my github i'll open the colab so i'll open see how i open so google colab i'll type so i go to collaboratory i go to my github repository just to open the same thing na then i put this i put it across here then i search this so see what happened it opened in my colab this is connected to my google account please see all of you have google so all of you can do this experiment it is not necessary that okay i don't have the i don't have access to gpus right so i don't have this etc you have all these tools run time you here you can do uh, you can run all you can do all this see okay sir so, uh, you can change run time type hardware accelerator you can go and give gpu you can give tensor processing unit tpu all this thing i'll go little bit later but i'm just telling you can use gpu just but there is some upgrade to colab pro plus right you can also pay and go ahead with this so uh, we are not talking about commercial aspects here so we will just say we will go we'll keep the runtime to be cpu we are not using GPU. so let's go and start training see convolution neural network is it simple to train answer is no right so what i try to do i'll keep this running and i'll show you on i will show you this this particular concept on my github right so the same example i'll go here convolution neural network so this is my uh, con general convolution so this my this my student who has done so i'm just explaining what she has put she has put some cars right and trucks some vehicles so convolution pulling relu convolution relu pulling flatten flattens then this so car truck van bicycle so these are the classes so hidden layers so this is what is hidden and this is classification they come as a package please remember hotel package right this only you are going to do input and take the output and you are going to tune the hyperparameters so we are going to mnist data set so it stands for whatever this 60000 all this all of this we have done now this is my mnist so see uh, she has written it on pytorch many people use tensorflow libraries you, there is one more pytorch also it is up to you what you want so this notebook python notebook interact to python notebook my student has written on pytorch so i am going to import the necessary libraries because if i do not import these libraries what will happen anybody retrain network will not work because yeah the data has been already trained with those images right or the data right now but suppose libraries are not there that time suppose confusion matrix how you will find out anybody so it's already inbuilt huh? right it's already inbuilt we are using it 
or else what i have to do to write confusion matrix i have to write uh, say one page of code okay what we used to do during our phd days but i used to do at least i think uh, you also you are doing uh, majority of the people who did early we were writing big big amount of code just to find out roc i i myself have spent 3 days writing code now i see only one function is there written by these people who have written see here pytorch is an open source machine learning algorithm by facebook ci group so facebook researchers have given this in pytorch library it's just like our simple our institute library or your uh, city library where you are going you have all your books what you want you go and take it right so here it is also like this import this library using import function this is like just like import for the people who know c imports std io.h right so i say run so i am running this file here import necessary library so it is going to what it is going to do plotting matplotlib right so i am going to plot matplot so i am going to plot all the things i am going to plot images pre trained as my, uh, he was telling any pre trained libraries are there that i am going to take see here ram and disk it is using for for people who want to know i am using uh, six, six this uh, 16 uh, gb ram so my laptop here is 16 gb ram and uh, the disk uh, whatever i have is is 1 tb okay so that's what is the computing power on my machine currently what is running but it is not running here okay it is running on the colab it is running on the uh, on the cloud this is on the cloud so i have imported the library i go to next step once i imported library i should take my data set data loader so go and do this take your data set and take your data loader batch size all this part mnist is the data set which you want so you have to take your mnist all these commands are directly available you only need to take so you put it in the training right you put it in the training then you load it then you put in the test set then you put in the test so batch size all these parts you put so i have run this okay so if there is any error or uh, this it will give you so it see from yan li kun from it has downloaded and it has put it so li kun's website it has taken mnist these many uh, gz means uh, it is zipped file so it is run this then you go what are the images the images are 0 to 9 run it if anything is wrong it will give you red color it will give you an error so my train setting is the labels are this is supervised classification i know my labels so 0 1 2 3 4 till 9 10 labels are there these are my labels i go down let us visualize this data to see whether it is correct or not so this is the visualization here so i load this to see uh, because i have run this it is showing for first but if you are doing it for the first time it will not show so it is when you run only it will show so see 3 so this see, see this mapping this is 3 this is 8 then there is 0 then there is 6 then there is 1 then there is 9 then there is 3 then there is 1 so these are your inputs you should be very clear what you are trying to do okay your inputs are correct or not whether they are correct 28 by 28 or not if you see the size is 28 by 28 okay so that you do now you go to your model so you this is your model what you do convolution layers you use some filters you use so we are not worried about the filters how much we use kernel now we are not worried we are just starting so we are not worried but when you become a, a middle level or an expert you should be worried about on this so take your 28 by 28 input feed it to the layers pull it convolution pull it drop out then fully connect get the output 10 classes okay and cross entropy is used somewhere in the training in the training process cross entropy is used so go to the convolution here so this is how it is shown i have shown this in my slide she has also put it here so this is what is convolution slide take a filter slide it over the image go on taking the filter slide it compute the dot product put the values so this is what is your convolution so what we do this is what she has shown on gif so this is again she has gif what is pooling she has shown so amongst these four eight is max so eight is put among this 6 is max 6 is put amongst this again uh, this 9 is there here so 9 is put so this is sure she has shown the gif for max put then the uh, non linearity so it should not go on going exponentially so it should stop 
so we use a max function please recall even professor burney was using max so max pooling max non linearity to to prevent the exponential growth in computation we used so relu or tan h even tan h we can use so but we use relu is a more common just like max pooling is common relu is max uh, you common your the function of relu is 0 z max of 0 and z so the idea is you get like a, it's like a thresholding very broadly you can think it's a thresholding so now what i do i bring this i bring this i start running this neural network model i go here i brought this i put see how easy it is convolution con 2d right then i put my parameters then i put max pool 2d 2 by 2 though i took so much time to explain convolution and max pooling one line code from where it is coming pytorch you might also take it from tensorflow you might also take it from tensorflow you might also take it from kf only the uh, the name of the function will change but the uh, what that function does is going to remain same right so go on doing this here so here when we see go on doing this here convolution pooling how many ever layers are there go on putting this so write this amount of code right so go on writing then you do forward pass so you do pool and you use this relu so relu is also directly a function fully connected fc means fully connected one layer fully connected two layer fully connected three layer this is what her architecture is you go here it's shown in the architecture fully connected one layer two layer three layer right so pooling every year she has told what she is using so we are going into this we are going into this so we have already run this you get a tick mark here on top we go down now training utils this optimizer whether you want to run now we have to train this only model i have written i am not trained here i have not started training so if you have gpu start training on the uh, gpu cuda right if it is not there then use cpu cpu is also computing power right so check if gpu is available or not here i have not uh, not applied gpu so it is giving me cpu gpu is not applied i can go to run time and do what change run time type and here i can go and select gpu then what it will tell it will tell it is gpu is available but let us do it on cpu first before going to gpu so what i see i check whether my gpu is available or not check fails it says that gpu is not available so i use cpu so now what i try to do i try to use this step it's it should go across different steps i take the model right i have to minimize the loss then i have to use this cross entropy this is the cross entropy loss this function again one line function see here criterion is equal to cross entropy loss you don't need to write summation px log qx no it's already available so we just bring this so let's see whether i have executed or this or not i have not executed so uh, i have executed this i have not executed this i this i have executed so i'll go down i have not executed this i so i make my variables clear train and validation clear so i go down i go down here i use cross entropy loss so i take this from cross entropy okay this is your uh, this gradient descent okay this is your gradient descent optimization we use stochastic gradient descent optimizer so this we just use for uh, enoc so that it goes by optimum till here you look no problem just in 0 second 1 second it is running but now when i go here training it is not easy if i start running this i'll do it i'll do it to show you see it will go through entire input because i have taken my entire mnist i am not reusing any parameters here please see i am not i have not used any pre trained models now i want to show you training i want to show all of you what is training so let it take time let it take time so when i see training it is going through all my 60000 60000 data all it will run right how many times that is called epoch so it is called epoch how many times it will run so i can set that i can see i can do that and see accuracy so i have set here so she has set it here 
okay and you see this is the run this is a training what she has written the training part everything is available and she has echoed the time so that it goes on showing that whether it is finished or not so this is what she has written here simple amount of code she has written and and if it is finishing training it will give you the results and it will also tell how much time it took but see now if i run this what will happen so i am running my training algorithm i say run cpu is used and you know and i go down see here the this loss means cross entropy loss and it is going through this is first epoch epoch number 1 next is how many digits 60000 is there it has gone into 3000 like this right see it is on my down you can see executing 36 seconds it is giving here so you can go on so this is going on reducing here see so here if you load this it is go on going here okay so here you can go on saying that it is it will go on going every time what will happen every time your loss will start reducing so here you could see i can go a little bit down see this 4000 it has to go through 60000 examples first first iteration first iteration so finished training for epoch 0 time taken this many seconds so next it is going through next epoch right it is going through this you know it will go through that many epochs so this will keep on running right so we cannot wait na to run this model we cannot wait we have to go ahead with our testing and all this so let me keep this running on my machine on the right i go to my on my screen i show you this same thing which is already run here it is running here huh? it is still running here it it takes me a lot of time if i select gpu it take less time so here i am just showing you this is the model relu is used this is what was written by her then max then you do load then training training you these are the import validation loss then after that you look px log x training file we are running this training here on the on our computer here this training is going on correct so it is already trained we have put it in the training part so this is what you get so this we have just put it for people to understand okay so it goes through this training cycle here fifth epoch sixth epoch like this see this you what you observe is loss keeps on reducing that is the funda na funda is what that you have to get as much loss so once your loss becomes very very small your your network is ready network is ready to see network is ready to see dash data can you fill in the blank test data yes network is ready to see my test data so here my test it is it is still going on right here whatever i am trying to say here see it is still going on we cannot wait for see i cannot wait for all this it will take 20 minutes i can go for a cup of see now you know the life of a machine learning engine. we can we can fix up the error yeah we can change yeah we can change that uh, all these settings we can change but i want to show you an accurate model so i have put through the many cycles i have asked her to go through many cycles so that by the time it cycles out i explain you my model here uh, my model here so please see this model here it goes goes on how much time it takes is also given right so for e, uh, for this epoch how much time it took it gives so here goes on like this see this i have just copied this entire part so it goes through these many cycles so all this will ha is happening on my my uh, pc here because now we cannot wait so we assume that see all this happens and we will go at the end yeah we will go to now our model is ready right so we are now going so so no improvement you see after training 16 there was no improvement the loss did not increase or the, the, sorry decrease much 
so stop we stop that so she wrote wherever the training is less than threshold that no more improvement is large between this epoch and that epoch if the difference is not very large stop she wrote that code so at 16th iteration epoch it stopped it came out right so no no improvement so we got finished the training now we have to go to test that so in order to test that you have to load the model its weights it has learned no it has learned the weights so we execute here we cannot go because it is still training right so we still training it has to come through the 16 epochs so here we load the model so we load all this this model whatever was trained so please see this is my trained model i just increase the font for that for you to see it properly i am having another screen on my side here right side to see whether i am going okay or not right so it is visible or not i am just seeing it on one more screen here so i just see there is one chat mm, yeah i think there is no issue so here we are loading the model so here we want to bring the model why we are bringing the model so that we can test it training is over my model is ready to fire neural network is ready to fire i start testing so i start testing using what using what unseen data which is called test set so i give the test set so ground truth i know because i am holding na it's like your exam you are given one question to your student you know the answer right and next you want to check whether the student wrote right or not you can take that analogy so you have your ground truth data test data you are giving you are giving this so you gave seven when you give seven here the uh, classifier the model now we don't call classifier we call neural network model the neural network uh, echoed seven then you gave two it gave two you gave one you gave one like this you continued nine nine so good accuracy on the test set whatever you did it's good right so it predicted your ground truth was seven to this it predicted seven it it gave you the prediction seven four all this for all the five data so five percentage five it gave you the outputs so testing was good how much is your accuracy let's let's go and see this is just some five examples i have it is not necessary that i i have lot of examples in my test set maybe 10000 are there i don't know 20000 are there so accuracy should run for all so accuracy will not run for only these four five so somewhere it will misclassify okay wherever zero is written in a very tilted fashion it will misclassify so let us check the accuracy here after testing this so here we are going here into this accuracy of the network after this so many is 99% is okay on the test set how many images you tested i have written i means the student has written that around uh, uh, 4000 images were tested and 99% accuracy was obtained for this classification simple network convolution max pool convolution relu max pool or dropout fully connected right now my next task is there next task is what to do it on unseen means hand written i don't know so somebody will say that hey how do you know you would have given that test uh, set also you would have given during training you want to show your accuracy is very nice na no? i am not joking na no? these are the things which which are kept whenever this challenge is happen they test it they see whether that before bringing that model out they check unknown data also they don't believe that this is tested kept who knows they would have given during training how do you know right so they give you the they give the right hand if it is hand written digit they give hand written and if you say for example image processing you want to they, like one of our participant was asking asiatic lion whether it does or not i i want to check they give a new picture from there and say now you test on this say whether it is lion or not. how much accuracy it is telling it is lion because it belong to cat class also so it will tell uh, this lion is 98% cat is 80% are we getting this point so it is not that all time it is going to tell this is a tiger or lion correctly that percentage is measured so it should tell you similarly here somebody gives we have given to this network i'll show once my model runs it is still running so here we have given to the network unknown unseen hand written digit so it is not present there in that so we have given that and we have checked it. so here before doing that so this is the random image which we checked so on the random image this is what i was telling you 
on the random image we checked we gave we uh, we put it in our drive say google drive scanned it made it to that size size should match if size miss it will throw an error it is not in my size we made a png file to this right it's a gray level image 28 cross 28 cross 1 okay we just blew this up to show you it is not the please note this size is not 300 300 because it is very small you can't see that's why we have blown it out it is actually 28 this size internal size is 28 28 but only that we have blown it up to show that it looks good on the screen or else it look very small it five was given here and this was given to the as the image input to the model and when we saw the answer was five so on random hand written digit sc uh, scanned also it worked this model worked and we also measured on every on every digit how much accuracy we measured that to understand which are difficult to classify so if you read this we tested accuracy on individual digits 0 1 2 3 till 9 we tested individually we tested and we observed that fairly our analysis uh, we are engineers or we are scientists we are going to analyze so these numbers throw some assumptions that uh, zero is anything which is 90 because only two numbers are there here 99 and 98 so we say that 4 and 5 are difficult to recognize similarly 7 8 and 9 are difficult to recognize as compared to 0 1 2 3 3 right uh, and uh, yeah 0 1 2 3 4 4 these are difficult to recognize and these four are here here 98 98 98 98 little bit difficult these are easy you can plot confusion matrix also here so you can do that experiment and you can again one line code she has not written but you can always see where the so you may ask one question to me if 5 is misclassified by your classifier so obviously it is misclassified so the classifier has not told 5 so it has not told 5 in my case here it has told but in case for many sample if i read 5 very badly it has not told 5 so you can ask me if it has not told 5 then what your classifier has predicted you can ask me this question so that uh, you can see from confusion matrix so what you are going to do i just put in my collab session here i just increase this i put here before i go here here so what i try to do here is so i'll have to put a confusion matrix 0 1 2 till 9 like this these are the test i know this i have this data with me so this is my test this is my test set this is my test set which i have with me and i want to know what is my classifier predict this what is my model prediction i should not use the word classifier now i am using neural network model so here again i type 0 1 2 till 9 and if i used if i used 10 uh, say uh, 30 images suppose i use 30 images then it should lie all should typically lie 30 each 30 each class then everybody should lie in the principal diagonal so here 30 zeros should be classified as 30 zeros 31 should be with 31s correctly right so that is happen may happen or not we don't know that depends then my question is if this is not 30 if this is 29 where my class one went did it go to 0 did it go to 5 did it go to 8 so suppose it went to 8 then i will i will get this information you will get to know that misclassification went into 8 then i have to design some other because in toto in toto you have to get 30 only here if you total all these amounts so here the third this is also second one is also 30 third one is 29 here 29 here plus 1 here this is also 30 and like this also it should be 30 so here also it should be 30 here also everybody should be 30 for zero whatever is attested what i am trying to say is you will analyze these are all analysis examples okay so we are not going into details it's 11:15 so let's go and see on my screen whether my model has run see it has run i hope you i am okay okay so it has run so let's go like this so we let's see this 
so you can quickly go through this down it's very large but still i would like to show you till 16 no? so 17th iteration came down right i can see on my screen also right so it go we went down finished training let us load the model i'm going to load the model let's evaluate yeah there is an error here because maybe uh maybe the training went off it did not go through the entire cycle let me see what is the error so let me test it and see the model is already there so let me test it yeah this is runs these are the two parts which are there let us run this yeah so here you got if you see it's a practical case so you see what has happened my uh, training has got interrupted in between so 7 here is being predicted as 4 2 is being predicted as 4 because reason happened here my training failed it stopped after 12 okay so here i have to retrain are we getting this so here i have to retrain because it did not go through the it uh, it is no improvement was found after 6th it should have actually gone through the it should have actually gone through let us go back here let us go back here it should have gone i'll fix that error here later so here what it should have gone through so you would have seen 17 iterations but there was an interruption here and interruption happened so here what happened my epochs did not go through so it came out of the sixth iteration itself so model is not trained properly so here let us go back to mnist whatever we ran so here it will it is no improvement with previous best model out of six so there was a throwback here so the model did not load because my weights were not updated so what i have to do here in this like this we face lot of difficulties so there is no other option but to go for retraining so there was a train error here we have to go through train or uh, training again we don't have time to go but we'll i'll keep it there and show you tomorrow also that why the training came out okay why the model was interrupted so we go through this training we come out and once it is only if so if you have an ill trained model so it will start predicting wrong so this was an ill trained example here so here instead of getting this okay so here instead of getting this your accuracy started dropping okay so here printing predictions were went wrong for the model right 4 4 4 4 was predicted whereas your numbers were 7 2 2 but when we ran this earlier we had got the proper one so this requires a retraining so i'll keep it for retraining today and we'll go we'll uh, again when we come back tomorrow i'll show you this model and we'll go for it okay so here with this with this part i think we are done with our uh, uh, with our cnn part so i'll just take some questions if there is on the chat there is no questions here on the chat so i'll stop sharing here and ask you if there is any questions so that we uh, we come across uh, one by one we'll address all that it's 11:15 so i have typically i have half an hour more i have planned for something okay so we want to keep that part uh, through yeah any doubts here with regard to understanding the concepts which have been told till now is it okay yes sir yes. okay uh, any other questions if anybody is feeling awkward or etc can please type huh? don't feel anything here so uh, see it's a it's a it's a course where all of us learn something uh, we make mistakes i may not have told something correctly or all that is accepted 
right it is not ideal so even for the accuracy for very good models is 99% so we are human beings so obviously we would have made some mistakes while telling or the way in which it is told you would not have understood make sure that you get it clarified here so that i and don't think that i'll take any uh, exceptions here that what i'll think don't do all that the te- uh, person is uh, a teacher is one who learns daily okay so new things they keep on learning so yesterday also when i was seeing professor bernie there writing uh, i was observing that uh, we are he was using the pen and the way he was using his uh, uh, this uh, what do you call this uh, the video i was trying to find out how he is doing that okay so but when we are using we are using this as a pad and this is window how is he trying to do that on both so again i was getting my inputs from my daughter you know he is using an apple pencil and from apple pencil uh, that uh, one more mac can be connected that camera can be synchronized so we also learn daily right so we learn from our students who come our research students our btech mtech students they tell us so many things you know sir inception model has come they uh, i say which paper did you read i say uh, recently it came out in this so then they show me that then i go through uh, if i get my time in my administrative meetings i am having my paper here and just reading this this is how we learn so don't think anything that okay it's becoming difficult i don't know how to ask be very sure you can type also and you can get it okay so i think this is okay from uh, from your side what's what i can observe so but what i would like to also do is like to tell you some things on uh, i think we have gone through yeah so we want to spend a little bit time on this adversary because a uh, professor bernie is using this adversary defender defender adversary like that i want to tell you quickly my my understanding you know? professor bernie has taught you the mathematical part let me explain you from common and common day exam so let's do that and that's what is was my target for last half an hour so i am again sharing my screen and uh, let's go with a simple example here so what i'll try to do is i will try to put some extra slides here uh i'll try to put some extra slides here so that we can write it we can annotate it and write it okay so we'll try to understand our uh, course because now till now we have understood what uh, we have been doing with my notebooks training testing simple things ensemble classifier here there training testing how to do all that part we have understood but we have especially he is trying to do on adversarial adversaries i did not talk it out on day 1 day 2 because uh, we want to, uh, we want uh, uh, the the clarity to come a little bit later after he has finished so he has finished fairly some mathematical part today he is giving you examples see any system is there so you have any system so let's draw let's look at my interpretation of this i have discussed this with professor bernie also sometime and i have told you that this i told him that i am going to tell this the system part of it some system is there need not necessary forensic system it may be biometric system also so let us uh, example face recognition so let us take face recognition need not necessary that we should always talk about forensic or uh, this we can also talk about network but we are not talking about network here so let us take this is a face recognition system all of us know everywhere it is there even facebook is doing this face recognition it will tie a bounding box and tell that this may be this person right so what is the face recognition trying to do face recognition is trying to do face recognition here where many faces suppose we want to train a face recognition suppose we are training right we just now we saw training so we are going to put so here uh, let me put myself i am putting my face here so here i am going to give say all my photographs and i'm going to supervise no this is supervised i'm assuming supervised so i'm telling that this is so and so person like this there is some other person here so we are putting this person's photograph here so suppose i use monali's photograph here i have this later when my students have done face recognition i'm going to show it to you tomorrow monali here or say uh, uh, jayant here is there so i'm putting these people now this gets trained all of you know convolution neural network all this stuff we do all this training testing we did it uh, trained for so many days on gpu etc etc after this it is giving you some output levels so output levels. so now now here this assumption is this assumption is very nice assumption 
very nice assumption that system is not uh, this system is not secure so there is no security here it is unsecure this is something what we do in our lab we want to do this experiment we train this using these many images recognize or not this is unsecure system biometric system a face recognition you can do it via thumb recognition right hand uh, digit recognition you can do it for gait human gait you can do it for anything just some biometric i have taken face biometric so now this is an unsecure system it gives now here what we are trying to understand i'll annotate it with a different color okay so here let us see somebody knows here what this face recognition system is somebody knows here he is called or she is called adversary so a natural question may come to you or sir how this adversary will come to know what is used here will that person come into the lab and see what you are doing answer is no we are talking of a actual scenario where now you know na google net if somebody tells my face recognition is using google net then i will tell google net has 120 layers in 120 layers uh, first three are inception blocks next is relu after that uh, max pooling i know it right because that architecture is easily available online so i know the system in the sense that if somebody says that it is google net uh, so google's face recognition system or facebook then i know it is resnet so i know if i know if i know this is google net obviously if, because facebook is using or google is using i know that google net is used inside as an adversary and i know that here resnet is used for facebook i know these people i know these architectures they are not different huh? what is different number of layers are different convolution max pool convolution max pool like that you have increasing somewhere you have dropped etc basic idea you know that google net is what how they have made google net and you know how you have made a resnet that is known very easily it is known correct so now the adversary knows your system he knows your system now what they will try to do they know that you are going to give these inputs for training now this adversary will go and launch an attack so that attack many attacks are there we will see few in collab examples also we'll see attacks so it will launch an attack on the system how different ways it can uh, it can attack as a black box it can attack as a white box it can attack professor burney is going to explain that in detail i am not going to touch i am going to tell you my simple view it's going to attack so when it is going to attack this system suppose my recognition of my name ravi here monali here jayant here suppose this system was with 98% accuracy 98% accuracy was there suppose plain vanilla plain vanilla in the presence of an adversary this will drop we we have done experiments my students have already published one example one paper on this where your dropping is 50% we have attacked this system we reduced it from 90% to 50% assume now what happens suppose suppose this is applied at uh, say a parliament this recognition is applied in parliament we know what happened in 2002 when the parliament attack took place right so you are 50% of the times you are going to tell wrong things so for 50 50 it is head and tail what professor burney was explaining yesterday toss at coin 0.5 0.5 so 50% times you will tell it is ravi 50% time it will tell you are me <laughs> sorry 50% tell you will tell, tell monali random 50 50 we want our system to be 98% so this is an example of an unsecure system because it is not accounted for the presence of an adversary are we getting this point no account is there for an adversary it just plain vanilla somebody did in lab went and applied and put it in parliament okay so it is not except that's why you see a uh, commercial organization don't take lab work they don't take lab work because they don't know the loopholes 
they will say that you give your implementation then we will change it and then reuse because of this sort of machine learning is where you uh, now you say that no no i know that adverse adversary may not be present right but adversary should be accounted into so this area of research where we are accounting please see we are accounting for the presence of an adversary accounting for the presence of an adversary we are going to say that yes i will account i will assume that adversary is there and then build my system so what i will do here i change my in color here right and i build a new system on which is i put this so the yellow ink which is there is going to give it is going to give me security me means i am telling the face recognition system obviously if you take out the accuracy of the if you take the accuracy of this yellow color which is built accounting for your adversary presence can anybody tell me what would be the theoretically what should be the accuracy here same as before that is what we aim it should be 98% yes it should be 98 it should be 100 also good but what do you think is it possible no answer is no so your answer will lie in between anywhere in between all this even if you account for an adversary and reach 85% to this date right even if you reach 85% to this date still it is a good system because it is accounting for an adversary's presence this sort of i have taken example of biometric okay depends because on the adversary also it depends on what type of that's what i am telling what professor bernie was telling i wanted him to finish yesterday is what type of adversary is there and what kind of attacks that adversary can launch right what type of attack he was telling about launching an attack yesterday right today he is again going to speak about that what kind of attack he can launch and now who who are we this yellow color line who are we can you tell who we are in terms of what professor bernie was telling in mathematics this yellow color we are dash fill in the blanks anybody i can see the chat you can put it who we are when we are accounting for accounting for the presence of an adversary and building a, a, a adversary aware system what are we doing technically we are securing yes we are securing but what is the word that he used yesterday anybody i expect at least one one answer i can throw a hint to save time we are the dash we are the i write this we are d you know, one of the answer is encryption okay Uh, in cryptography it is encryption decryption but here in the security yeah what you are saying is right with regard to encryption decryption so we are the d d for what an attacker has launched an attack we are a d d for what fill in the blanks nobody yes i think i got an answer defense what what we are we are a defender we are a defender so there is an attacker here so here let me change my ink so here there is an attacker who is launching an attack so here there is an attacker attack 
on a face recognition system and we are trying to secure that we are the defender and can you tell this attack and defend and attack and defend what is this cycle called what he called in his uh, in his uh, lectures anybody nobody what did he call in yes game theory he called this as game theory he called this he modeled this using game theory where an loop is there between attack attacker now knows defender is there now he is now intelligent right intelligent okay attacker is going to attack this is just like your game of football leave all these face recognition uh, encryption leave all the go to football how is the football players organized goalkeeper goalkeeper then you have with along with goalkeeper whoever will stand on the other half of the circle uh, near the goalkeeper are the defenders for those teams they are the defenders okay then in between who are the, the in the midfield right the in the midfield they are uh, they are called something and the person is going generally going to run after the midfield and go towards the other is the attacker okay so common examples of football players okay you know uh, maradona right so you know pele earlier days nowadays it is who i think you know with regard the, the attacker with regard to the it is uh, messi who is attacking so along when messi is attacking there is a defender who knows how to defend so the defender is going so they are playing a game they are playing a game which is game theory or it is also cat and mouse cat knows wants to know go and take the mouse tom and jerry right and uh, it tries to make it smart put something outside for food rat comes out and rat knows that he has kept it for me so that i come out so it is a cat and mouse loop which he try to avoid via game theory and give payoffs for attacker and give payoffs to the defender are we getting this so if we design such a system we are talking about security we are talking about security so example i have taken here biometric because biometric is more because people understand in work security denial of service so it may uh, it may happen uh, so with regard to uh, your uh, uh, forensic with regard to video analytics it may happen at different places it may happen at different different places but he has taken the uh, he is focusing on some multimedia forensics attack right so that game which is being played is a zero sum game is what he was explaining the defender and attack today we are going to hear him again with regard to this problem so here what we are doing is this area is called adversarial so it is adver serial so you would have seen this s a r i a l adversarial signal processing so it is not necessary that it is only in machine learning it can come in all in all areas so it is general signal processing so just like you are having signal processing is general right so here this is the top is signal processing your any signal your image this is maybe any signal if you have a 1d signal it is called a uh, audio or a speech or a music a 1d right so if you write it as one more subset so one subset is audio one subset is image so this is 1d i am writing 1d here one subset is image processing image so which is a 2d signal which is a 2d signal then you have a 3d video one more time is also there 3d so here you have a 3d signal which is video right just like signal processing is there here adversarial signal processing can be applied to your machine learning okay where you are you can you can fox a svm classifier you can fox a linear regression you can fox a decision tree or you can apply it to deep learning dl dl where you for go and uh, confuse a uh, google net go and confuse a uh, uh, linet or uh, this what you call inception or you go and confuse this resnet architectures so these are ml and dl 
and if you account for adversarial person to be present then you are doing security analysis it's an interesting upcoming area in signal processing where we are giving importance to security because nowadays we assume that people are very intelligent and they are going to use their intelligent for deceiving others so we secure the system by uh, by doing this this kind of area or the course that we are going into is called adversarial machine learning adversarial deep learning or in general adversarial signal processing so yesterday he talked so there are a lot of attacks so here attacks are there here so here all of us know what are the so here attacks so please go back to let's forget all our technicalities right let us go back to our age old days where we are seeing these wars right right from the religious wars what we are seeing different kind of attacks is there so here you know that there is some formation uh, some other formation here so if you go to your earlier they say chakra view right is an attack chakra view is an attack agree with this but this can be broken so the defense is so what they do in chakra view they try to take you inside they try to take you if you have studied this if you studied this area this chakra view you would have seen the Ab abhimanyu thing what we know if you have studied this in detail so they he knew how to go in right but he did not know how to come out because he had not learned the entire thing half thing he had learned so he went in by going and because he wanted to go and attack that person he went inside he couldn't come out because he did not know the entire thing in which it is so here there is but other people could who can come out so if you say this if you beat this if you beat this then you call, then you are if you are able to defend this chakra view and come out so then you are doing your whatever is the role of a defender so defense strategy so what he was calling yesterday defense strategy so he was playing strategic games and he was trying to model it via probability so because this is chakra view and all you cannot uh, tell right so strategy for breaking this chakra right so here there is an arrowhead formation nowadays if you see mig aircrafts or rafale come out with an arrow formation and arrow formation is a attack if you are if you know this field if you have studied it in defense arrow formation arrow formation is it will all the flights will be in arrow formation and they know how to separate out and they know where where that area who will bomb that and to hit that is very difficult so defense against arrow formation like this in army you have several formations we are not going into this all this part so here attacks technically here i think he will explain today you have gradient based attacks gradient based attacks then you are, so you will go on down across a gradient then you are having a defense against the gradient based then you have attacks named behind some people just like leenet vnet and all alexnet and all is there like that you have some defenses named behind people one of the attack is karnev levy c and w attack we we'll learn this cw attack karnan and livics the uh, this attack so there is this attack again there is a defense to this so this is what we are going to hear from professor burney here it's 11:45 almost uh, on my screen here so let me just stop this because uh, this was what was my uh, idea today to tell in between the general view of a security so if you are doing any system design accounting for an intelligent adversary then you are into the area of adversarial signal processing and of course signal processing means machine learning deep learning is all there okay so with this this is my simplistic way of telling you uh, the things that i know from my view so maybe professor burney will be there today uh, again will be telling it in a his own fashion of doing this but this is how i see this particular area an upcoming area uh, where people can uh, do their research can publish can also give uh, is not fully explored yet so there are people like professor burney is there there are five more six more people who we are in contact with so they are the people who are there for different different for biometrics there is some other group for network there is some different group for forensic there is some different so the thing is very uh, large
so with this i think we'll uh, end it here from my part especially with the presentation today whatever was the coverage is that i have finished and i think uh, this session typically ends i want to keep from 5 minutes for question and answers here so if there are any question and answers you can have some questions so please ask me i'll be happy more than happy to uh, to tell you if i know please go ahead no right now the attacker uh, some of the standard attacks uh, people are uh, trying out uh, how to gauge uh, or estimate uh, how people are thinking how to try to attack uh, so that's a challenge i think so what is yeah. your uh, yeah 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 so if you would have seen the smile on my face it would have been very obvious so you told the answer to the last it's a challenge yes Uh, how to gauge an intelligent adversary so typically it's challenge and not yes and no answer to this no because now we know na what are the types of attacks that he can do he can know the training style he knows the training uh, samples he knows for face recognition face will be given so what he can do he can give some other other things there he can corrupt that data so instead of giving faces he can give something else so you can do that whatever yesterday you were telling label poisoning okay so here you can go in different ways so we now know we know what is their strategy it's like chess you are playing a game of chess you know how the bishop will move you know if you keep this what he will do so this is the uh, role of here and you have an adversary here you have uh, you have a, a attacker adversary is called an attacker is an attacker here you have defender right still if there is a goal in a football match then whichever country has scored the goal whichever country to we belong that is happy isn't it it's just like that it is challenge yes and no both new form of attacks are coming that's a challenge okay for old forms of attacks defenses are already built so if it's a very intelligent adversary they launch an attack like this and uh, you believe me the russians are very good in their math so we may think that uh, the other countries but russians and israelis are very good in their uh, in their attack strategies so attack is not only here even for email you can attack you can put in security or you can easily attack your email systems so whatever uh, spam and all comes so spam finding out whether this mail is spam or not so if it was an important interview call and it went to spam what will happen right so that that itself is again boiling down to whatever sir was telling professor bernie sir was telling yesterday true positive true negative perfect typically 100 100 you take 100 sample if it is like this 100 100 to true true what i was telling satyameva jayate right if it is true true very good very nice but it is not like this we have people who are like this cunning people right they try to launch attacks so where they are telling they are going and attacking false positive and false negative they are trying to make your true positive false positive true negative this uh, so you should true negative go into false negative so the box confusion matrix which we drew that four quadrants which i drawn uh, the principal diagonal quadrant is very important but what the attacker will do whatever you are putting in principal diagonal uh, that quadrant that person will try to put it you misclass put it in this in machine learning i am telling he will try to put it here and here at these two places at false positive and false negative and many samples go into false positive only then who is succeeding attacker is succeeding and if you are able to mitigate that attack by not allowing him to go in that false positive false negative and you are right in true positive true negative then you are succeeding defender is succeeding right so it is like it is a zero sum game that we are playing and it's an interesting problem it's lot of challenge it's lot of challenge yes any other questions you can use your chat so if you have any issues you can chat uh, yeah i think uh, one request is there from our participant navin kumar uh, can i a link to watch recorded yes you can all of this is being streamed actually gyan office is monitoring us Uh, we are very thankful to gyan uh, program because uh, we uh, we got this opportunity to talk to professor bernie and formally invite him uh, to uh, deliver all the talks so gyan has been very supportive so gyan uh, via ministry of education is being monitored by iit kharagpur so iit kharagpur is monitoring all our sessions so this uh, 
this stream is getting live stream on we uh, we have done arrangement for live streaming it on youtube so that's why you would have seen it's done from my machine itself so i am doing three things i am doing zoom my staff are there with me they are somewhere else so i am doing the zoom part uh, we are doing the live streaming from here as well as we are trying to record this uh, so it is being live stream we'll give you the youtube link and we'll try as much as possible to zip this make it a small copy and distribute because we also have to send it to gyan office and gyan is in, is also that's why we couldn't change the schedule nor even 5 minutes we could do here and there nor we could uh, accommodate any request from participants because it's a tight program that we have and professor burney is very busy so today also morning early morning is what he sent me that and he is busy with his uh, it's a very well known acclaimed researcher that we tried from december to fix these dates of these four days these five days because his calendar is already booked for a year or a year later so that kind of thing we have so we are thankful to gyan office for doing this uh, must that it should go on youtube so that it's on my youtube channel so we can always see this so thanks to my team my computer center team who is monitoring they are even recording the youtube uh, team uh, they are also we are also recording i myself am recording it here so our, our morning starts a little bit early in the sense we set up our stream uh, we stream that and i do some part i give it to one of my student he puts it somewhere else then my staff so it's a team work that is involved so with this i think i'll i'll give you uh, navin kumar as you have asked we'll definitely give it so i think if that is okay then we can end it it's almost as i always say i give 10 minutes before i my session starts at 12, stops at 12 so i always be 10 12 minutes uh, so that we get some time uh, so that we have some discussion so if the discussion is okay so i'll wait for one more minute if the discussion is uh, not there then we could close for today so well, means for this session we meet there is a change in timing as i have told you yesterday also professor burney joins at at 2 o'clock india time because it will be early morning means it will be morning for him at 9:30 at uh university of siena italy so we are now uh, i think slides i have sent via email you can go through that and we can also we will be happy to listen to him also so if there are no more uh, questions so we could end this session so is it okay or do you want to ask anything yeah so i think it is uh, okay from my side so i'll leave this meeting and uh, my team will be of course there you can join later also so we meet again today at uh, we we meet again today at 2 so we go for lunch and we go come back okay so thank you very much for joining and having a session with me and we'll uh, uh, again catch up with professor burney's session so thank you again so thank you all
Hello, Manish. I'm yeah. here. Yeah, good morning to Professor Bernie and uh, good afternoon to all the participants who are joining. Uh, as uh, we know, we are in day three. Uh, so, Professor Bernie has sent all the slides. So, I have circulated among the participants. So, without taking much time, so I think uh, we know the uh, agenda for today. The agenda would be uh, looking at the adversarial part from the attacker's point of view. So, that is what is the agenda for today. So, we are passing it on to Professor Bernie. Uh, for his talk. Sir, please. Okay, th thank you, Manish. I mean, I apologize for the five minutes delay, but I had to restart my my Wi-Fi router because I had the problem with the connection. So I had to switch it off and start it again. So now, now it's okay. So, uh, okay, I have to share my screen first. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you already sharing your screen, perhaps, because I'm not able to do it? I have enabled it. Okay, okay. Right. Now, now it goes. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Can you see it? Yes, we are able to see. Okay, good. So, welcome, everybody. I hope you have digested all the math <laughs> I introduced to you yesterday. Now I promise you that today I will have less math. A little bit of math is something interesting. It's also today, but it will be uh, absolutely uh, less heavy today. Now, so look at here, what you have to do. Uh, just to put uh, what I'll do today in the correct framework. Uh, I already gave you the general introduction to adversarial signal processing and introduce this very general theoretical framework to study adversarial signal processing and in particular uh, binary detection in the presence of an adversary. I, I did so by using tools from game theory and tools from information theory and also from statistics or statistical signal processing. Well, now, uh, I want to turn to a more specific, uh, a little bit more narrow uh, field where the presence of an adversary may have uh, its effect, and it is adversarial machine learning. Nowadays, machine learning, and in particular deep learning, is uh, replacing most model-based techniques. Uh, so studying uh, the presence of an adversary in an adversarial, in, in a machine learning framework is particularly interesting. I have also to say that applying the general theory as is to this field is quite difficult. So I will use today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, a more practical oriented approach. So you can keep the general ideas that I gave you until yesterday in the back. So to give you the general a view of the field, but these days I will not apply it very much. I will resort to game theory here and then, especially tomorrow, but for the moment, I mean, I will adopt a more mm, bottom-up view rather than this general top-down approach that I used yesterday. Linking the two perspectives is not so obvious. I'm still working on it. And I think that bridging the gap between the theory and the practice can be very useful. But for the moment, there is still a big gap between the two. So you may find some of the things that we'll say today and tomorrow to be a little bit unrelated to what I've done so far. But this is not, at least from the general perspective. So today I will focus on adversarial machine learning in particular. And this is the topic. So again, let me introduce it. And so I will give another introduction and motivation that are specific to the machine learning field. So we all know that uh, uh, deep learning or machine learning, or as it is always, it is usually said, artificial intelligence, even if artificial intelligence goes beyond machine learning, nevertheless, the application of deep learning techniques to security application 
is increasing every day. So nowadays, uh, researchers are developing tools based on deep learning for malware detection, multimedia forensics. You know, this is the uh, main target of these talks. And then also biometrics, traffic analysis, tag analysis, intrusion detection, denial of service detection, data mining for intelligence and, and homeland security applications, cyber physical security, and many, many others. So we can say that deep learning, and all, all, in, in all this area, we are using deep learning or machine learning for security. Nevertheless, when we have security-oriented applications, we cannot uh, ignore the presence of an adversary. Otherwise, this wouldn't be security at all. So uh, we have not only to consider deep learning for security, but we must investigate the security of deep learning. Because otherwise, you're using deep learning for security applications, and rather than doing something better, you are introducing a new security breach into the system if these deep learning tools that you're using are not secure themselves. Good. But I have to say that until, I mean, at the beginning, nobody cared about this. The security of deep learning was not a concern until this paper came out. This is a very famous paper by Goodfellow in 1913, so about 10 years ago. In this paper, uh, these authors have shown how easy it is to fool a deep learning system, even the most effective and the most robust one. So if uh, the security of deep learning was not a concern until eight, nine years ago, after this paper, everything changed because we discovered that deep learning systems are in principle vulnerable against attacks. And there are many striking examples of that. Uh, the adversarial examples is, is the most famous case. So here, the, the, this one very famous picture, you have seen this for sure. And the idea is that if you have an image, sorry, representing a car, you can add some small noise to it and have another image of the same car where you can barely notice the difference. You see, there is some noise around. Eh? This is the original car. Everything is smooth here, for instance, in this area. If you look at the image after the attack, you see there is noise here. Eh? The image is not as clean as it used to be because this noise was added to the, to the image. Of course, this is a very, this is a magnified, version of the noise. The noise is not so strong. The noise is barely visible. Here, I have magnified it only to show that it is uh, noise-like looking. There is no structure inside it, just a little bit. Now you can, you can barely see maybe the, the wheel here and the yellow car in the back. But adding this small amount of noise that you can notice, but to our view, this car is still a car. The CNN that was attacked changed the classification from a car to a toaster. And this is not a toaster. And the same here. This is a panda. And here you have a noisy version of the panda. The noise is barely visible. You see, it's almost equal. But, and the noise is this one. But after noise addition, uh, the CNN classify this panda as a monkey, as a gibbon, which was of course wrong because we humans can really see that this is a panda and the one above is a car. So these CNN classifiers that work so well in general can be fooled very easily with examples 
and that would not fool at all a human viewer. And there are other striking examples. In some cases, this is another very famous paper, you only need to change one pixel to make the network fail. So for instance, I mean, these are very low resolution images. Uh, going to high resolution is a little bit more difficult, but I mean, this still applies. Here you have some, a picture, and this is of course a ship, but changing this single pixel here makes the network fail and think this is a car. This was a horse that is misclassified as a frog by changing one pixel. This is a deer classified as an airplane and the many others. A bird classified as a frog. Again, a deer classified as a dog. A dog, a horse as a dog. A car as an airplane. By changing only one pixel. So what's happening here? These networks work wonderfully, but, and this is similar to what I said two days ago. If I add some random noise to these networks, they will continue working perfectly. They're very robust against random noise. But if the noise I'm adding has been designed carefully, just one pixel here, but the right pixel in the right position, then the network fails. Even here, I add a small amount of noise. This looks like random noise, but it's not random. This noise has been particularly thought to misclassify these images in this network. So it's not random noise, it's a tailored, fine-tuned noise. And, and this does not apply only to digital images. These examples is also famous. It has been shown that you can bring these attacks into the physical domain by modifying the images. So this was a way to attack uh, a biometric face-based recognition systems. And uh, it was shown that, that by adding these fancy glasses, you can uh, misclassify the identity of these persons. And this again, is not a standard attack because people do not wear these kind of glasses by chance. But if you know how the CNN works, you can build these particular glasses with this particular noise in it so to misclassify your identity. And not only this, uh, this is again another example, and not only digital, these are other examples in the real life domain. This is a, a traffic sign that was modified uh, in the physical domain with these patterns here by adding this kind of noise. And when this uh, traffic sign is re-scanned by a camera, is misclassified as I remember, I think it is, kind of, it is a turn, red, turn right signal or something like that. And even for videos, uh, this is an example. Uh, does this video work? Oh no, this is PDF, so it doesn't go. I'm sorry. It's not PowerPoint. Nevertheless, this is a turtle, a model. It's not a real turtle. It's a model of a turtle a plastic turtle, where the, 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 the upper part of the turtle has been painted in a particular way. And when this turtle is framed by a camera in a moving video, this turtle is classified as a rifle. This is not a rifle, it's a turtle. But these attacks can also be applied in the physical domain. Mm. Good, so the existence of these attacks already mm, focuses the attention of researchers on the security of DNN and CNN networks. Well, I can say that uh, these initial concerns turn into panic, really. Three years later, so in 1916, when this other group 
Wow. Have shown a property of these attacks called transferability of adversarial examples. With these examples I've shown before, you need to have a network. You need to have access to this network. You, you, you should be able to query it as many times you want. And then you can tailor a particular noise to fool this network. But you could still say that, well, I mean, this is a very theoretical attack because in practice, the attacker may not have access to my network. I only need to keep my network secret to make the attack fail. Well, this is not the case because in this other very popular paper, good fellow Papernow and McDaniel show that these attacks often are transferable. You can attack one model, one network, and if you use the same image, the same noise on another network, the network can still be attacked. And this is one of the examples reported in that paper. Then transferability of the attacks was proved again later, and it, turns, it turned out to be even worse than this. But I mean, here you have five DNNs trained for the same for, for the same task. And then he, what you do here, you implement, you compute your attack of one of these network and see if the same attack works on other networks. Of course, when you are on the diagonal, you are in a good situation because the source and target networks are the same. So this means that you can attack these networks, these images with 80%, 86, 84 probability in general. But very often an attack thought for, for instance, network E, if this applied against network A, it still retains 75% success rate the attack. Again, here, B against C. In some cases, it's not so successful, but you have at least 49, so around 50% probability that the attack works also when it is used against the network different than the one for which the attack was stood for. Sometimes this also applies when you change from one kind of machine learning system to another. Here you are attacking a DNN and see if this works against DNN, uh, SVM, KNN, and others. Not always, but sometimes you can also transfer when you change the kind of architecture you have in mind. But this is less important because we are interested in deep learning mainly. And if you stay in deep learning, the transferability may be a problem. So I can say that when this property was discovered, well, at this point, concerns about the security of deep learning techniques raised to a very high level. And in, I mean, in the last 10 years, there have been tons of papers published on this topic. Many, many researchers started thinking why DNNs are so vulnerable to attacks and how we can uh, robustify or make them more secure. Good. Yet, yet, the security of machine learning is not a recent history. Uh, if you have been following this field for a while, you should know that uh, already in uh, 2004, 2010, 2005, and then in 2010, people have been studying the security of machine learning not just deep learning.
And this is a bit strange because in this period, and say about 15 years ago, or almost 20, people didn't care much. There were these papers saying that, I mean, machine learning could not be so secure, but people didn't care much. So why now everybody is caring about deep learning security? What's special with deep learning that makes uh, this adversarial example so threatful in this field? Well, something is sure related to the popularity of deep learning. Deep learning is so popular, is spreading so fast and in, in all aspects of our society that anything dealing with deep learning immediately gets a huge attention. Good, great. But as I will try to show you this morning, there are some particular features of deep learning that makes deep learning architectures particularly vulnerable to adversarial attacks. And basically the reasons are these three. I will elaborate on this later. So the partial dimensionality, the fact that deep learning tools work directly on the pixels rather than on features, and there are no handcrafted features. And then uh, a lot of this has to do with the bad propagation, with the existence of bad propagation algorithms to optimize the attack. And this does not exist for other kinds of machine learning tools. So I will try to explain uh, this morning what's so special with deep learning. Good, so given this, what is the goal of today's lecture? To give a general overview of machine learning security, then focus on deep learning security and explain why deep learning is so special with regard to security. And then try to overview which are the challenges that an attacker has to face with in order to develop a good attack against a deep learning system. So today I'm gonna to take the point of view of the attacker. Tomorrow I will take the point of view of the defender. So let us start from the beginning. Before I do that, do you have questions, observations, some curiosities? So let us go. This is a, a general picture of a machine learning system. And I can use this to underline which are the basic assumptions behind machine learning, something that an attacker may exploit uh, for the attack. So how does machine learning work? You have a system that you are observing. So suppose you want to classify images. So this observed system will have some intra-class variability, not all dogs are equal, and some inter-class variability. Dogs are different than cats. Then what you do is that uh, you uh, acquire some images or some samples, and then you add also some measurement noise. So you have two kinds of noise, natural, intra and interclass randomness and measurement noise that is introduced at test time. Now what you do in standard machine learning, in, in classical machine learning, you extract some features and then you use these features to train your machine learning system, for instance, in SVM, and then you apply this train detector classifier to test data. So here you have training and then you have testing. In deep learning, the feature structure module does not exist because the features are learned during training as well. 
So the deep learning route to machine learning is to skip the feature extraction and train your architecture to extract the, the features, the best possible features for your problem. Good. And this is part of the huge success of deep learning. You don't need to have this feature extraction. Great. Then everything works if these two conditions are verified. Training and test data should follow the same statistics. In other words, the training data should be representative of what you will find at test time. In addition, the stochastic noise that is introduced during acquisition should be independent of the machine learning tools. So the system introduces a noise that is not depending on the tools that are using. These are the two basic assumptions behind any machine learning system. And if these are not satisfied, your system may fail. Always remember this. Good? Great. What does happen when you have a malicious setting, when you have an attack? What happens is that these two assumptions do not hold anymore. Why? Because the attacker knows, can observe the system. He knows the features, if there are features, if there aren't, you don't need. And he knows possibly everything about the training algorithm and about the trained detector. And so what the attacker can do is that he can introduce a measurement noise because the attacker here, I suppose that it works. I mean, okay, he can add some noise for which the independence assumptions does not work anymore. Why? Because this noise is explicitly, is explicitly thought to fool this classifier. So the noise introduced by the attacker depends on the machine learning tools. Something that contradicts the basic assumption behind machine learning. So there is no guarantee now that machine learning will work. In addition, the kind of variability, the kind of noise that the attacker will introduce is something that is not part of the natural intra and interclass randomness. And so the statistics at training test in time may, may be different. So even this new assumption may not hold. The training data is not representative of what the system will see at test time because the attacker works only at test time in this particular example. Good. So look at, at this. Uh, likely, during training, this CNN has never seen images with one bright pixels here and there, because this one bright pixel is not something that you find usually in normal images. And so the attacker may exploit this to his and uh, for his goals. Good, so the vulnerability of machine learning comes basically from these two observations. The noise introduced by the attacker is not independent of the classifier, and it can introduce something that has never been seen at training time. Like for instance, these kind of glasses. The system has never been trained with people with these glasses on. And so when these glasses are there, and even more, these glasses has been designed in a way that depends on the system, the system fails. Okay, so 
let me, uh, before I dig a little bit more into this, let me show now some examples, generic, uh, of how the attacker may exploit these two uh, bugs, these two problems, and uh, to fool a classifier. To start with, the attacker may use a tailored rather than a random noise. And remember here, the general framework I gave you the day before yesterday is useful now. When we speak about security, noise is not random. Noise is tailored. It's thought to work against you. And then we speak about security, which is not robust. In this picture, I want to exemplify this. This is just a, a picture representation. In a few slides, I will give a precise mathematical interpretation of this. But for the moment, be happy with this figure. I have two classes, C1 and C2. And I have a sample, the red one, in class C1. I want to add some noise so that after noise addition, this sample is misclassified as a C2. Suppose now, and this is not by chance, that there is only one good direction for the attack. The attacker will work only if it goes in the direction of C2. All other directions will keep the sample inside the C1 class. So you see that if I add some random noise without knowing where C2 is, if the noise added during measurements, this could be measurement noise. Or this could be intra-class variability. This kind of stochastic noise is random, doesn't care about C2. So it can go in any direction with the same probability. And so the chance that your noise goes exactly in the direction of C2, this probability is very small. So it is very unlikely that random noise addition will bring the sample from C1 in C2. But if you are an attacker and you know exactly the boundary of your and you know exactly the boundary of, of your detection region, then you know this and can design your noise to, to go exactly in this narrow direction that is useful to fool the system. And you will attack your system by adding a very small amount of noise. Why? If you go in this direction, you need a huge amount of noise. And if you go in this direction, you will never exit C1. So this is the difference between security and robustness, tailored, versus random noise, a noise that depends on your detector and noise that is independent. This is what happens with adversarial examples, exactly. Then you may explore the fact as an attacker that your training data cannot cover the entire space of images. You can gather a good training set, a huge training set, but this training set will never span the entire set of all possible images. So if you have examples in this region and this region, there will be other locations in the, in, in, in the image space that have never been used during training. And in this part, for instance, here, and for instance, here, the classifier will work more or less at random. 
the classifier has never seen these kind of images. So he will decide for one of the, for one of the two classes at random. If the attacker knows it, the attacker can use the presence of this empty region to design an attack that uh, introduces a small amount of noise because going from here to there, it is worse than going from here to this close part. Images here are not present in training set. And here you have an example. What is the example? Wow, here we go. It's broken. Mm -hmm. Let me retake it. No, my system is. Um, so let me close it and reopen. A moment. Okay, now it goes. And here I have two examples. Huh? Look at this. Faces like this have never been seen during training for sure. Because you never have errors in such a way. So maybe a face detector will simply not find any face here. The attacker knows that the face like this has never been used during training. And so it tries to use this part, this empty part of the, of the training space to fool the classifier. Or the second example, this is even worse. Suppose you have a face recognition image and you feel and you feed your face recognition with an image like this, which is not a face at all. The face recognition system network very likely has never been trained on images like this. And so if I'm asking to the network, is this image Mr. Barney? Well, who knows? Maybe the network says yes. And this is a way to fool a classifier by exploiting the fact that the training set cannot cover the entire space. Images used at test time are statistically different than the images used at training time. The kind of variability at test time is not the same that was used at training time and the system fails. Another example, the attacker may exploit, uh, may corrupt the labels used during training. And suppose you have the red class here, this is training, this is the blue class. And if you train your system with these two classes, you will end up with this smooth. You, you, you will end up with these two smooth regions. Suppose now that you can mislabel some of the examples. This here. You turn this into blue. The classifier will work like this because the classifier must uh, classify these uh, examples as blue because they have been labeled as blue. Well, at test time, you can use the presence of this part of the detection region to move other red samples into the blue region with a very small distortion. Because at training time, you introduce some kind of mislabeling that modifies the detection region in the way you like. So this is another game. Another problem with machine learning, label poisoning. When you have model-based systems, this is not a problem because you have no training. So there is no label poisoning there. Okay? So given these general ideas, given this general framework, in this uh, uh, course, I will consider two major threats. One is adversarial examples. They are very famous. They are carried out at test time and they are kind of evasion attacks. I will talk to you about evasion attacks later. 
And I will spend today and tomorrow speaking ad about adversarial examples. I guess you know them, but I will try to uh, dig more into them. And what I will do on Friday, I will introduce another kind of attack, which are called backdoor attacks that exploit poisoning or training data for later explo exploitation, like here. I will not care about this today and tomorrow. I will care about this on Friday. Backdoor attacks are new. Adversarial examples were, were first introduced in 2013. Backdoor attacks, the first papers are around 2000, maybe 17, but most of them are 2018. So these are new attacks that are getting more and more attention from the machine learning security community. But today I will start with adversarial examples. Good. Clear? Again, a stop if you have questions, curiosities. Good, a little bit of taxonomy so that we know what we're talking about. In my talk, I will focus on classifiers. You know that DNNs are not used only for classification. They're used for other things. You can have a, a image transfer, you can have denoising, you can have compression, you have autoencoders, you have inference, I mean, this is too much. I will focus only on classifiers. But these other architectures can also be attacked. When you have a multiple class classifier, you can distinguish between targeted and non-targeted attacks. In a targeted attack, you have, I don't know, a car, and they want this to be misclassified as an airplane not as a bicycle. So the target class of the attack is fixed. These attacks are more difficult and you can have also non-targeted attacks. In a non-targeted attack, you simply want that the network misclassifies the input. So you have a car and the goal of the attack is that this car is classified as anything but a car. Of course, non-targeted attacks are easier. Very often, I said this yesterday, in security applications, we care about two class classifiers, that is binary classifiers, detectors. In this case, the attacks, I mean, in this case, we don't care about targeted and non-targeted because we have only two classes and the name of the attacks uh, get a, a very precise meaning. So in a binary classifier, you have two hypotheses or two classes, call them as you want. These are two hypotheses, or this could be two classes, where usually class zero is a kind of normal status. A class zero or hypothesis zero is the standard state of the system where nothing special happens while H1 or class one usually is a kind of dangerous situation where you have to do something. So the row tells you the ground truth and the column tells you the decision. Everything is okay if you are in the diagonal. While if you are out of the diagonal, you are making an error. And Depending on the kind of error targeted by the attacker, you can have an evasion attack or a denial of service attack. Evasion attacks means that you take an input produced under a dangerous or anomalous uh, state, and you want the system classify this as a normal state. This is an evasion attack because you want that the system does not 
considered does not recognize the presence of a possibly dangerous situation. Here you work when there is something to hide. The other kind of error is that you are in a safe situation and you want that the system thinks you are in a dangerous situation. You want the system to think that there is something anomalous while there is not. Maybe you want the system to think that there is uh, the no an intrusion going on when there isn't. If this happens, the system reacts in some way, and then maybe the service that you are targeting is no more available. And then in this box here, we speak about a denial of service attack. The system is in a safe state, but thinks to be in a dangerous state. And so the service is no more available. Very often with adversarial examples, we target evasion attacks. And attacks can be carried out at training time and or test time. As I told you, today I'm focusing at attacks carried out at test time. So if we look at this general picture here, the attacker interfere only during testing and not during training. Good. Now, whenever you have to attack a system, whenever you think about security, you have as the very first basic question, care about the knowledge that you have. Knowledge is important to win your battle if you are an attacker. Here I have two, uh, two mottos, one from ancient China and the other from more recent uh, a fantasy book. But in any case, we know that in a battle, knowing your enemy is the key to your success. Good. This is a parallel view with respect to the game theoretic view introduced yesterday and the day before yesterday. When you know everything about your enemy, this means that you are playing a game where you play second. Your enemy plays first. The defender builds the system. Then you know everything about the system and you can attack it. And you may distinguish two situations. Attacks with perfect knowledge or white box attacks and attacks with limited knowledge that can be black box attacks when you know nothing or gray box attacks when you know something. This makes a huge difference. So let us say that phi is your system. Your system will depend on a certain number of hyperparameters. I don't know, the number of layers in the network, if you're using dropout, uh, if you're using a convolutional layer, uh, the kind of uh, activation function that you're using and so on and so forth. Then it depends on the feature space in classical machine learning or the weights of your network and on the training data. In a full knowledge or perfect knowledge scenario, the attacker knows all of this stuff. You can assume that you have a copy of the system that you want to attack and you know exactly all the details of the system. You can look into it, look at the weights, you know about the training, you know absolutely everything. In this case, you can mount very powerful attacks. Then your attack may be targeted and non-targeted. And so, I mean, what can I do? I cannot say everything. In this talk, I always focus on non-targeted attacks. The extension of what I'll say to targeted attacks is possible, but not trivial. And in any case, in security, we often care about a binary case. And in a binary case, there are only two classes, 
So whenever you misclassify, you go into the other class. So in the binary case, targeted and non-targeted attacks are the same. So the goal here will be to answer the question, is there a special relationship between deep learning and the adversarial examples? But before doing that, why this has to do with adversarial examples? Because in the first instance, in the original Goodfellow paper and many other papers, adversarial attacks work in a perfect knowledge setting. We'll see this. The way adversarial examples are built, assume that you know absolutely everything about your system. So all the attacks that we've shown at the beginning, I'm going back very fast. These attacks, these attacks, these attacks, and these attacks have all been carried out under a full knowledge scenario. You know everything, you have the system in your hands, and you can modify it as much as you want. So the attack works, the attacker works in the best possible situation. So Given this, are adversarial attacks easy to build? Why they are particularly easy to build in the deep learning case? I have my explanation that relies on many papers and I will try to convey to you this explanation I have. Before I go, questions? I want to go slowly today. No questions? Uh, if I understand well the, the program of this uh, course, in the next days, during the uh, practical lectures, you will learn how to use adversarial examples to attack a classification system. Now, why? And uh, we know, we know from papers that under a full knowledge setting, adversarial examples are easy to build and very effective. And I remind you, adversarial examples are evasion attacks working at test time I care about non-targeted attacks in a full knowledge setting. Why are they so effective? There are many explanations around and I will go through them uh, starting from the simpler, moving to the more complicated ones. The first explanation about the effectiveness of adversarial examples has been given by Goodfellow and the same researchers that discovered adversarial examples first. And they call this the linear explanation. So let me go through it. There is some math here, but nothing with respect to yesterday. Suppose your system works as follows. You have a network, phi, or any function, phi. This is not a network. You have a function, phi and a threshold T. Your final decision is made by thresholding the soft value produced by phi with a threshold T. And this is what happens in neural networks. You have the output uh, nodes, you threshold them with a certain threshold T. You can do this with the soft max layer if you want to bring the threshold to zero five, and then you decide for one class or the other, according to whether phi x is larger or smaller than the threshold. In the linear explanation, we assume that phi is linear. So no network here for the moment. Phi is simply a linear combination 
of the inputs xi's and the linear combinations is by means of a vector of weights w equal to w1 w2 wn good you carry out this linear combination and then you threshold it suppose that your sample x belong to class zero and class zero is when phi x is smaller than a threshold so if your sample x zero is in class zero it means that phi of x zero is smaller than the threshold so suppose your phi zero is t minus delta good the goal of the attack will modify x zero into x prime, which is equal to x zero plus a perturbation z, so that phi x zero is larger than t. This is what we want to do. We want to find the z so that this is larger than t. Good. Now, how can we do it? Uh, we want to do this with uh, not a big distortion uh, because we cannot change x0 too much. We want that the attack images are similar to the original ones. So we assume that the perturbation you want to introduce is MSC bounded. So the mean square error you are introducing is bounded. And so what? The sum of the perturbation, because Z is the perturbation, so Z is your attack, which is given by Z1, Z2, Zn. And the one that the norm of Z squared, which is the sum of Zi squared divided by N, is smaller than a certain bound, gamma squared, is the MSC bound. I could get similar results for the infinity norm rather than the squared norm. The situation is a little bit different. I mean, I will not go into it, otherwise it will take me too much. Good. Now, what can you do to attack? Why not adding a random perturbation? This is random. No, it's not security. Nevertheless, this is a random attack. Good. So I generate my Z as a normal Gaussian distribution, zero mean unit variance, and a multiplying parameter gamma. In this way, the MSC bound is very far. Uh, why? Because uh, what we have here, sum over I z i squared, the expected value of this, since the z i's are independent, will be the sum over the expected value of the z i's. And this is sigma squared, that is equal to one times gamma squared, of course, we have gamma here. So this sum will be gamma squared times n, and if I take the average norm, this will be gamma squared, and so I'm satisfying the bound. Good. What does happen to phi if I add this perturbation? What we'll get is that now phi x0 plus z will be equal to sum from one to n w i x zero i plus sum i to n w i z i everything is linear now how much is the expected value of phi x zero plus z 
it will be the expected value of the first term, this, which is equal to the expected value of phi x zero. So phi x zero, there's no randomness here, plus the expected value of the noise part. Everything is linear, noise independent. Noise is independent of W, important. This will be sum over I, W is constant, E, Z, I. This, this mean is zero, so this is zero. And here we have the result. After noise addition, the expected value of the output will still be the same. So on the average, adding noise will not change anything because this will be T minus delta again. On the average, your noise doesn't do anything. Still, your noise has a variance and you already seen that the variance, oh no, we can compute the variance. We can compute the variance of noise. Good. How much is the variance of noise? This is the computation. Now, have to compute the variance of sum one to n wi x zero i plus sum over i wi z i. The first term is constant, so it doesn't care about the variance. So this will be the variance sum over i, w i, z i. The z i's are all independent. So this is the sum of the variances and will be sum over i, w i square, e, z i square, or variance of z i. This variance is gamma square. And so this part is the norm, the square norm of W, gamma square is constant. And the variance of the output of the network after the attack will give gamma square norm squared of W. Good. So what happens? After the, before the attack, this is the threshold T, this is what you have before the attack. And this is class zero, this is class one. After the attack, you have a Gaussian whose mean is the same and with this variance. So after the attack, you have something like this. And there is a certain probability that what you get after the attack is above the threshold. So there is a certain probability that the attack will work. If you want this probability to be large, it is necessary that the standard deviation of the Gaussian is much larger than the distance between these two. So much larger than Delta. It should be K times Delta with k big. In this case, with some luck, our probability can be 0, 0.5 at the most, because this is very, very large. And this will tend to 0, 0.5 at the most. But for this to work, it is necessary that this variance is larger than k delta. Go here. This means that gamma, which is your MSE bound must be larger than this quantity. If you want that your attack, random attack, succeeds with a non negligible probability, your gamma, that is the power of your attack, <laughs> should be larger than delta, which is the distance from the threshold 
and inversely proportional to the norm of the weights of your linear combination. Good, okay. This can be a lot or can be not a lot, but this is what you have, good. Suppose now you do not want to add a random perturbation. Suppose now you go with tailored knot. Oh, it doesn't work anymore again. Wow. Fine. It's too bad. Let's do here. Okay. So now suppose you have an adversarial perturbation. Now you know everything about the network. So what does it mean here? You know everything about phi, so you know W, basically, and T, and delta. But what is important is that you know W. So now you will add the noise that is parallel to W. So EW is the verse of W, so EW is a vector equal to W divided by the norm of W, so that the norm of EW is equal to one, it's just a verse. So you add Z in the direction of W, and then you adjust the strength. You have gamma and square root of N. In this way, the norm of z squared is equal to gamma squared n norm of vw squared, which is one. This will be gamma squared n. And hence, the norm of z divided by n is equal to gamma squared. So you satisfy the MSC bound. With this particular noise, the mean square error you are introducing is again gamma square. Good. Now, let us compute what happens to phi when I add this particular kind of noise, which is no more random. So there is no variance here. Here we have just one particular value. What does it mean? So, phi x0 plus z now is equal to sum over i, wi x zero i, as usual, plus sum over i, wi this quantity, that is gamma square root of n, e w i. How much is this? This is exactly phi x zero. Why well, this quantity, gamma square root of n goes out and vi ewi divided is equal to norm of w. Why? Because this will be sum over i, wi, wi divided norm of w. And this is norm of w. So now what you get after the attack is this quantity. The perturbation on the output is no more a random variable, is no more zero mean, is a positive quantity, always positive, because the normal W is positive. And if you want the attack to succeed, it is net, since this was, since phi zero was T minus delta, if the attack should succeed, it must be that gamma square root of N norm of W is larger than delta. And hence gamma, your MAC should be larger than this quantity. And you see that there is a big difference with respect to what you had before. Before you had only 
there was this k larger than one, maybe two, three, and then there was delta divided by square root of n. Now you have again delta divided square root of n. But then you have also a division by square root of n. If n is large, the presence of the square root and the denominator tells you that you are able to attack the system even, even when gamma is very, very, very small. You only need n to be large enough. And in neural networks, n is large because n is the size of the input image. So it can be in the order of hundreds of thousands or even millions if the image is big enough. So you see that applying an adversarial perturbation rather than a random perturbation gives you a very, very big advantage because now you're no more adding noise in a random direction, but you are adding noise in the best possible direction. That is in a direction that is oriented as the vector W. This makes the difference between random robustness against random variability and robustness against adversarial perturbations. That is security. By the way, if some of you is familiar with spread spectrum watermarking, this is exactly the same stuff as spread spectrum watermarking. Don't care about it. So let me give a geometric interpretation of this. Since phi is linear, it means that your decision region, the boundary of the decision region is an hyperplane because sum vi xi equal to the threshold is an hyperplane. So the boundary of your decision region is an hyperplane. And you have a point on one side of the hyperplane. And you want to go on the other side of the detection region. And suppose you have an MSC bound. This means that your attack, the, your perturbation must lie within this circle here. Good, because you cannot move. This was X zero. And this is the perturbation seat. So you cannot move more than a certain bound. What happens here? The attack will succeed if the direction of the attack is a good one. If you move into this arc, the attack will succeed. If you move into the outer arc, the attack will not succeed. So if you run a random attack, a Gaussian random attack, where all the directions are equiprobable, your attacks will succeed if you are inside this arc and will not succeed if you are out. How much is the probability that the attack will succeed? Since with Gaussian noise, uh, your noise or perturbation is distributed uniformly over the surface of your bound, the probability of success is the ratio between this arc or this spherical cup and this other spherical cup. If the spherical cup of good directions is equal, is equal to the spherical cup of wrong directions, then you will succeed with probability zero five. If it is smaller, 
as it is here, you will succeed with a probability that is lower than one, than zero five. Good. So let us consider the ratio of these spherical cups. I'm considering here, I split this in two because everything is symmetric. And I consider the surface of a spherical cup of angle theta in n dimension, this part, and a spherical cup with angle pi minus theta dimension n, this part. These areas, this, yes, these areas can be computed with calculus. This is, this is related to the theory of hyperspheres. And if you fix theta, so if you fix the distance between your sample and the boundary, so in a sense, if you fix delta in the previous line, for any fixed theta, when n goes to infinity, this ratio goes to zero. This looks strange, but it's not. When n goes to infinity, the number of possible directions grows so much that this angle, the possible direction that, le that leads you, that moves you into the region you want will be smaller, relatively smaller and smaller and smaller. And this goes to zero. If you are on a hypersphere with in Rn and n is big, if you choose a spherical cup with the angle theta smaller than pi, the ratio of the correct directions with respect to all the others tends to zero. In other words, if you are in these hyperspheres and you want to take one point at random on the surface of the hyperspheres, and you want to know the probability that this random point falls into a spherical cup of angle smaller than pi, when n goes to infinity, this probability tends to zero. So in very high dimensional spaces, a random attack will never work. But an adversarial attack where you know the direction and you can go in the right direction, the attack will work. Pictorially, what's happening is exactly this. This is what's happening. There is only one very narrow direction where the attack works. But in this picture, I was using this very picked detection region. The reality is that even if the boundary is flat, like here, due to the properties of high dimensional spaces, the regions for a good attack, the directions for a good attack will be very, very narrow. And so unless I know this direction, the attack will not succeed. And the mathematics here gives you the proof of it. This is a proof given in equations. This is a geometrical proof relying on the properties of high dimensional hyperspheres. I think that this is one of the best possible intuition behind the effectiveness of adversarial attacks. Is this clear? I move a little step farther and then we'll make a break. But is this part clear? This, this is very important in my view. This will give you a lot of insights about high and wow adversarial attacks work. Anything to say, to ask? Yeah, I was just curious, Professor Bernie, with regard to one issue, uh, 
what about the role of the bias because we are touching variance here so what is the role of the bias in this case for the moment here i'm using a linear explanation this is not a network huh? what i have here works perfectly when you not have any bias here huh? yeah so here i yeah so this was this like this dot product did not have any bias so if no. there is a presence uh, of a bias I, i will move to the networks in one minute but i don't think that the bias make any difference here because if you have here sum over i from 1 to n w i x i yes. plus b i then this will be exactly the same as before plus a big b and if this is equal to t minus delta then i want to increase this part by delta and the bias basically is constant okay it does not have any effect on the perturbation so this works also for a fine models not only for linear models okay yeah, yeah. So, but networks are not linear. So does this interpretation work only if a network is linear? No, it works also if the decision boundary and the, the function phi is smooth enough. Because if the network and the function is smooth enough, I can use a first order approximation and then you have the bias by the way you have a first order approximation now your phi will be equal to a phi x0 which is what you have plus the gradient of phi computing in x0 scalar product the perturbation so the effect of the perturbation on your function will be again linear will be the addition of a linear term to your starting point and this linear term is exactly sum over y gradient i z i so everything remains the same but rather than considering the weights itself i should consider the gradient of the function but nothing changes So now for a good attack the z should be not aligned to the weights i don't care now this should be aligned this is not e of phi this is e of gradient of phi the z should be aligned to the gradient and then e of phi is this and then what happens is that now gamma must be larger than delta square root of n gradient sorry the norm of the gradient before it had the norm of w but nothing changes if i add a random term what happens is that here we have k delta divided by gradient of phi in x0 of course and uh, having an aligned attack introduces this square root of n in the denominator that makes the attack effective even when gamma is very small assume that n is large enough so the linear assumption still works if your detector is not is smooth enough and of course if the perturbation z is small enough because this linear approximation works only when z is very small this is why attack like fgsn or fgn or pgd work against adversarial examples uh, they are able to implement adversarial examples let me show this and then we make a break if and 
this if I will uh, investigate later. If you have a boundary, which now doesn't need to be linear, and you are close enough to the boundary, your boundary is approximately linear in the surrounding because you can approximate what happens nearby here with a linear approximation. Now I have something like this. It's wrong. Something like this, for instance. If the gradient is in this direction, and then you move here. And if you know how to move, you can go out with a very small effort. And you can do this in one step. This attack works in one step. As long as Z is small, the linear approximation works and you can attack your system with, in one step because if N is large, this will be small. And if this is small, Z is small and the linear approximation works. Done. The circle closes. And so your network can be attacked because in your network, N is usually very big. Okay. How can we defend? Tomorrow. Uh, one last observation. There is this gradient at the denominator. So one possibility to increase gamma is to have a small gradient. If you are in a region where the gradient is very, very, very small, then this idea may not work much because you need to, uh, you need to have a big gamma because if the gradient tends to zero, then your attack must be very strong. This is a kind of vanishing gradient problem. that applies not only to networks, but also to attacks. And in fact, the initial versions of the attack, those introduced by Goodfellow uh, in that famous paper, rely on gradient. So the FGSM works like this. But then uh, other researchers found that in some cases, for some networks, this gradient can be too small, and then the classical version of the attack does not work because of these vanishing gradient problems. So they came out with other solutions that I will talk to you about uh, tomorrow to implement an attack also when the gradient is very small. And this simple interpretation does not work. Nevertheless, with these ideas in mind, you now know why adding a random noise to a car does not transform the car into a toaster and does not transform a panda into a gibbon. But if you build your attack in this way, you know the gradient, then you can easily transform a car into a toaster because N is big there and you can do it. And that's what you're doing. And of course, you understand from here that this attack works in a perfect knowledge scenario. Because if you want to compute the gradient, this is the gradient of the output of the network of the soft output with respect to the input. This is the gradient with respect to X zero. So with respect to the input image, not with respect to the weights. And in, in back propagation, we usually compute the gradient with respect to the weights. Here we compute the gradient with respect to the input. Well, in order to compute the gradient with respect to the input, you need to apply your back propagation algorithm. So you need to know all the weights of the network. Otherwise you cannot compute the gradient. It's very difficult. Computing the gradient in a forward way is complicated and inaccurate. While computing the gradient by back propagation is easy and fast. But if you want to compute the gradient with back propagation, you need to know all the details of your network. 
So these kind of attacks work only in a perfect knowledge scenario. Otherwise, after the break. So this is the first part. I stop here. Are there any questions, observations again? Otherwise, we make a 15 minutes break, 15, 20 minutes break. Yeah, yeah, I think it is okay. I had just one question. Uh, so how do we overcome this vanishing gradient problem with the ReLU or uh, by, by using a ReLU unit or using some regularization? So how do you come out? Of for the attacker? Yeah, for uh, that. I, I have some slides about this tomorrow. Okay. Basically, the best attack against this, this vanishing gradient is the Carlini and Wagner attack. And I guess you know about the Carlini. Yeah, yeah. Carlin and Wagner attack, and, and, and their system is exactly thought to avoid this vanishing gradient. And to start with, they do not apply the attack after the soft max, right. because the soft max really push the, 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 the vanishing gradient, because if you work far away from the linearity part, you have a vanishing gradient. And that's why Carlin and Wagner applies the attack at the logic level. Because at the logic level, this attack is this vanishing gradient is less important. And they also apply other corrections to, to avoid falling into this vanishing gradient problem. Okay. Uh, Professor Bernie, I have one question. Sure, go. So attack on data set means attacks on X naught or attack on phi, both are same. Uh, attackers want to change the data or they want to change the data exactly so 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 yes so this phi could be any learning model or any model am i right the phi can be a, okay right so if phi can be any layer exactly if it yes. is the last layer you attack directly the the final output yes but you could attack this and the, at the intermediate layers, and this works the same. You only need to back propagate from the middle layers down to the input. Sure. Okay. So we are saying that through phi, it will be affected by X on X through phi means through network. Yes, phi is fixed, network. but but if you add the perturbation at the input, the output will change. Okay. So mm -hmm. phi is a combination of weight W and X both. Yes. Uh, phi is a okay. combination of X and W. Alors, in, in the linear case, it yes. is a linear combination. Yes, or in non-linear case, some other. So attack in, in, in a non-linear case, if you want to apply this analysis, uh, we need to uh, linearize the phi and so this model works only for small perturbations. Okay. So because when the perturbation is small, you apply this is the first order Taylor expansion of, of the phi. Okay. So this, this works only when z is small, but in adversarial attacks, we look for small z. Small z. So attackers can change the x as well as attackers can change the weight w also. Or it's the same. No, 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 no. They, they cannot change the w. Because the network is fixed, we change okay. the input. W is fixed. Okay, okay, okay. We change okay. only the X. Only the X they can. Okay, thank sure. you. Others? Yeah. Any other questions from any other participants? Please can go ahead, or you can use the chat box. Uh, I think we can take a break of fifteen minutes. Uh, people who have questions can type in the chat box. Meanwhile. Uh, so we could reassemble, say, after 15 more minutes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. Good. Bye. See you. See you. I'll get some drink. <laughs>
Good to start the video. Hello, I'm back. Yeah, we can start. We can. Start. Yes, sure. Okay, I have to unlock my screen. Done. Okay, are you ready? We can go. Yeah, it's visible. We are ready. Okay, good. So, okay, we'll go either one step further because. Uh, what we see now is a little bit more research oriented. So, I mean, what I've done so far is very fixed, standard, everybody knows it. The next step is a little bit more advanced, but it's very interesting. And it could give some very interesting ideas for research. And uh, so, so far you are able to explain uh, uh, the existence of adversarial examples based on a kind of linear assumption or a linear approximation. But indeed, we can go farther. Recently, th th there has been a new interpretation of adversarial examples. I was also working on it, but these people arrived before me. And uh, that explained the possible presence of adversarial examples, even when the system is not nearly linear is any absolute possible classifier. And the idea is that uh, the existence of adversarial examples can be explained by the concentration property of measure or probability. And uh, roughly speaking, this concentration property says that for any measurable set, in a high dimensional Rn space, most of the volume is arbitrarily close to the boundary of the set. This is strange because uh, the idea is that when you go in very high dimensional space, like Rn, we then go into infinity, the usual intuitive properties of sets and geometry do not hold anymore. And some strange stuff happens. And the fact that uh, here, for instance, the ratio of the spherical cups tends to zero is one of these effects. But this FT is much more general than this. So I will try to explain and to convince you that this works in the case of upper spheres and then I will point you to a paper explaining this for other kinds of sets. So let us consider a hypersphere of radius R. Good. We focus on some geometric properties of hypers hyperspheres. This is the hypersphere, radius R, whose volume is this one. And this is simple calculus. You can find these in textbooks. And the volume of an hypersphere of radius r is this formula. It depends. It increases exponentially with r in n, but it's also divided by the gamma function. The gamma function, you can think about a factorial. Uh, the gamma function is the continuous extension of the factorial function. Good. This was the first observation. Second observation, let us consider the surface of a sphere. And now I don't consider anymore the sphere, but I consider not the volume, but I consider the surface of a sphere. Again, we have this formula and the, the surface of an hypersphere or radius n r is written here, good. As you can imagine, you see that now the radius, the power is n minus one because hyperspheres live in a lower dimensional space. Everything is similar, but there is gamma divide, there is gamma n over two instead of gamma n over two plus one. And in fact, it can be proven that there is this very interesting relationship between the volume 
of an hypersphere of radius r and the surface of the same upper sphere of radius one, or radius r. And the relation is the following. The volume is equal to the surface multiplied by r, because we need to increase the dimension from a surface to a volume, and very important, divided by n. When n increases, if r is fixed, the volume is much smaller, it's much smaller than the surface as a number. Uh, this, this rule can be proven from these two expressions, very easy. And in general, you can verify that this works when n is equal to three and n is equal to two. Uh, if you take a three dimensional sphere, the volume is four three pi r cube, but the surface of an hypersphere of a sphere is four pi r square, and the ratio hmm, volume divided by s is equal to three r. Exactly as here, hmm? uh, divided by r. Sorry, volume divided space is r divided by three. Sorry, is this r divided by n, which in this case is three. I mean, this is just a curiosity, don't care. This is one property of uh, n-dimensional hyperspheres. Good, great. What is important? I draw your attention to this n at the denominator. Good. Then last step, last property. If I want to compute the volume of uh, an hyperspherical shell, this. So I take my hypersphere and I increase it by a thick layer epsilon. Then the volume, if epsilon is very small, if it's infinitesimal, the volume of the shell is the surface. This epsilon should not be here the surface times epsilon, and this is trivial because it is the surface, epsilon is small, everything is linearizable, and then you obtain this, good? So now, let me consider an hypersphere of radius r plus epsilon. So I want to consider the volume in n dimension of an hypersphere of radius r plus x. And I want to also consider the volume of the same hypersphere of radius r. This tells you how much the volume increases if I add a thin spherical layer of thickness epsilon. Good. And I do it here. The volume of the bigger sphere is the volume of R plus, plus the volume of the shell, which is the surface times epsilon. And this will be equal to one plus the surface, the, the, the spherical SN, the spherical shell. No, sorry, the surface we saw before is equal to N, the volume N divided by R. So I put it here. And then the ratio between these two will be one, which is the part in common, and this quantity, because this go away, and epsilon divided by R. This means that this, if epsilon is fixed, maybe it's small, but fixed. If R is fixed, but N increases, 
then this ratio goes to infinity. What does this mean? This means that if I take an hypersphere like this in high dimension and I compute the volume in a spherical shell, even if the shell is very thin, the volume of the shell with respect to the inner volume of the sphere is infinitely larger. It goes to infinity. Most of the volume is arbitrarily close to the surface, to the boundary. Even because epsilon can be extremely small. We don't care. So the result is that in high dimension, most of the points in an hypersphere are within epsilon of the boundary. This is strange. This is not uh, uh, like our intuition of spheres. Uh, in normal spheres, uh, the shell of an apple or an orange is not most of the orange or most of the apple. But in high dimension, most of the points, the by far larger part of the volume is within epsilon of the boundary. And so this, the, the idea is that suppose you are in an hypersphere and you have a perturbation. So, and, and this hypersphere could be, I mean, anything. And you have a point inside the sphere. Is it possible to move this point out from the sphere with a bounded perturbation for most of the points yes because the great majority of the points are close to the boundary so if i have an hypersphere since most of the points are within epsilon of the boundary i can move any point inside to the outside of the sphere because most of them are close to the boundary even if the perturbation is very small, because this ratio tends to zero, regardless of epsilon. When n goes to infinity, this ratio goes to infinity, sorry. Wow, that's interesting. But there's more than this. Suppose you have an MSC bounded perturbation. This means that uh, the square norm of epsilon, which is your perturbation, divided by n must be smaller than gamma square as before. This means that the norm of the perturbation must be smaller or equal than gamma square root of n. So not only most of the points are close to the boundary, but if you insist on an MSE bounded perturbation, this allows you to introduce a perturbation whose norm increases with N. So let us go back to our problem. I have a point inside this hypersphere, and this could be your class C0. For the moment, this is an upper sphere. I will extend this later. But if I have my decision region, which is, which is an upper sphere. Sorry? Professor Bardi, Professor Bardi, I have one query. I have one query here. Sure, sure, please. So please. Then we can we infer that can we infer that then in higher dimensions, much easy to attack? Exactly. This is what I'm going to say in a minute. In high dimension, most of the points or most of the images are close to the boundary. So the attack is easier. Okay. okay. And this has nothing to do with linearity, flatness of the boundary, 
This is just a basic property of high dimensional space. Okay, that's it. Exactly. Okay, thank you. So this is exactly what I wanted to say. If C0 is your class, since most of the points will be close to the boundary, it's always possible to find the point outside the class that is misclassified. Good. Well, I demonstrated this for hyperspheres. There is a property in mathematics that is the isoperimetric inequality saying that this holds not only for spheres, but for any possible smooth set. Because you know that for a given volume, the sphere is the set with the smallest surface. So for other regions, this is even worse. If for a sphere, most of the points are close to the boundary, for other shapes, this is even more true because the sphere minimizes the surface for a fixed volume. That's very interesting. But, I mean, you have to go farther because the sphere example shows that most of the points within an hypersphere can be moved outside with a minimum effort. The inverse is not true because Rn is unbounded. So while it is true that most of the points inside the sphere are close to the sphere, if I go outside, I can have points that are very, very far away. So this intuition tells you that you can bring point from in to out, but it's not easy, it's not necessarily easy to move a point from out to in if the space is unbounded. But images are not unbounded. The images that are input to a neural network have a bound. They live in a hypercube. Because you mean that the pixels of an image at the input of the network stays between 0 and 1. Or if you go to the digital domain, from 0 and 255. So, the space at the input of a DNN is an hypercube. In high dimension. So if you take any possible classifier, not only a neural network, if you consider that your input space is an hypercube, I write this in two dimension, but think about this in n dimension. Any binary classifier, the goal of any binary classifier will be to split this set in two parts, possibly non connected. They can have small holes, they can be very complicated. We don't care. But in the end, any classifier is a partition of this hypercube. Doesn't need to be a sphere. It can be very complicated, but it is a partition. All classifiers are partitions of the hypercube. And in this paper here, three years ago, it has been proven, again, that under certain conditions, as usual, but these conditions are rather general. Uh, what is happening here? Under certain conditions, hmm? good. Uh, for any two set partition of the hypercube, if the volume assigned to both sets is not negligible, of course, if one of the sets is one point only, this does not work. It is always possible to move from one set to the other in both directions with a minimum effort. Because once again, within an hypercube, for any partition, most of the points 
will be close to the boundary. Assuming, and this for both sets, also for the white sets. This assuming that the white and the color sets have a non-negligible, not infinitesimal uh, mass, not infinitesimal volume. If this is the case, adversarial examples exist for all classifiers, not just for neural networks, because all classifiers will have the same goal, to partition the hypercube into classes. So it's not just a matter of DNNs. There's nothing special in DNNs from this point of view. Whenever I want to partition a high dimensional hypercube, most of the points will be close to the boundary of the partition. And hence, adversarial examples always exist. Even if, even if, and this is something for research, even if this partition is induced by our brain. If this point of view is correct, it may be that even for our brain, adversarial examples exist and they are close to real samples. This is very puzzling. But this is what said in this paper that I think is worth considering and gives a very general perspective on the existence of adversarial examples that then traces back only to the cars of dimensionality. The existence of these examples is only due because the input space of the networks and the classifiers is very, very, very high dimension. Yeah, Professor hmm. Bernie, I had one question yes. here. It's uh, it's maybe although out of context, uh, but since it is uh, written in bracket, including the human brain, so I'm tempted hmm. to ask here, uh, does it involve now, if we want to go ahead, some sort of cognition studies, cognitive analysis is needed to uh, uh, to ascertain and establish this fact? Or uh, has such a uh, study been carried out? Are my two questions. This, first of all, this is a very provocative uh, question, because in the next slide, I will say that there may be something that is not so obvious. But yes. I would be very curious to see if it is possible to build adversarial examples fooling our brain, our eyes with a very small perturbation. I have some insights about this in the next slides, eh? but this will be very interesting. I'd like to know if it is possible to build. And the problem is that we cannot back propagate our brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, 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 and we will see, this is what is special with deep learning, is that, I mean, the special, I, I will anticipate it. In my view, the special thing is not that adversarial examples exist with DNN, is that you can find them easily. Because this slide points only to the existence of the examples. Maybe it's not easy to find them. Good, so let us see something more. So, what the, this paper says is, are adversarial examples inevitable? Well, two points here. One, uh, three points. One is that the theory does not generalize well to infinity norm, but it's very technical. The other is that we are not speaking about multiple classifiers here. It is possible, I mean, when you have a two class partitions, this works. But when you have many classes partitions, well, what you can do is to move one point from inside one class to the outside. But maybe it's not possible to bring it in any class you want. It is close to the boundary, but the boundary to the outside of the class, not to any other class. So it's possible that only non-targeted attacks are unavoidable, but perhaps targeted attacks are not so always present. 
In addition, there is this other point, which is already pointed out in the paper. The fact is that most of the images are meaningless. If I consider all possible images in the aperture, when n increases, and I consider a uniform distribution in this hypercube. So this is like saying that all the pixel values are equiprobable and the pixels are independent. If I draw one image at random in this way, which means I take one image at random in the hypercube, I will always, always, always come out with random images, with noisy images because real good images, faces, the no animals, uh, landscapes, meaningful images are a very small minority of all the possible images. That's why we can compress images, by the way. Because if I draw one image at random, the probability that they come out with a face is negligible. You can try it. You can take your, your MATLAB, uh, do a loop, come out with images drawn at random in the hypercube, and the chance that you come out with a nice face is zero. No way. But they're all large numbers if you want. So this means that most of the images are meaningless. And so it could be possible that it is true that most of the images are nearby the boundary. But these most of the images are meaningless images. Maybe the good images live in a smaller manifold deep inside the classification regions. So when I say that, can, that I can move most of the images, this applies to the images on the boundaries. But these images could all be noisy like. And the good images could be well inside the classification region. If this is the case, then adversarial examples do not always exist for meaningful images, which is what we care about. So this is not the end of the story. These problems are pointed out in the conclusion of this paper. And I think it would be very, very interesting to study this problem further. It is a fact, however, that for the moment, all the defenses proposed so far have been defeated with a limited effort. So all the defenses against adversarial attacks in a white box, perfect knowledge setting have been defeated. Many proposals have been made. I will talk about this tomorrow. But after one month, two months, some people, usually Carlini and Wagner, come out with a new attack that can find an adversarial example. So mm, on one hand, the theory says that uh, adversarial examples may be unavoidable. There is this idea that maybe good images are well inside the partition. But as a matter of fact, uh, in practice, adversarial examples always exist. So maybe it's not true that adversarial images are well inside the, the, the class. Maybe that for all of them, there is at least one point of the boundary that is close to any point inside. I don't know. This is a nice thing, a nice research direction. This could explain why adversarial examples do not exist for our brain. Because if our brain was asked to classify noisy like images, we would be fooled very likely. But when you are asked to classify meaningful images, maybe our brain partitions the set of images in such a way that the manifold with the good images is well inside the region. 
I don't know. If you want to do some research on this, come to me, I'll be happy to work with you. This is a very interesting area. Not easy, in fact, but it's very interesting. So, Professor Burmi, please. So, can we get that manifold for good images? I, I mean, nobody knows. <laughs> okay. Nobody has a good description of uh, meaningful images. Ah, yes. Nobody has a good model of, of good images. Okay. It's difficult yes. to see. We know that they are a minority. Uh, if I draw an image at random, I never see something interesting there. So they are very, very, very few. Their volume is infinitesimal in the hypercube. But if they are, I don't know, restricted to a manifold, if they are spread all around the hypercube, if they have gaps inside, this nobody knows. Okay. That's still open, we need to look at. Absolutely. This is an open research problem. Thank you. Other observations? So, what's special with deep learning? Because in my reasoning, I went much farther. I started with the linear uh, classifier. I moved to smooth classifiers like deep neural networks. And then I went on speculating about uh, general classifiers, the manifold of images, the human brain. So I went a lot farther. And these problems are not necessarily related to machine learning and deep learning. So why these problems came out only now that we deal with machine learning? Because if this is the general problem of all classifiers, this should be applied to to know support vector machines, uh, random forest, the human brain. So why all of this came out with deep learning? What's special with deep learning? There is something special. The fact that adversarial examples exist doesn't mean that they're easy to find. This could be another answer as to why we do not find adversarial examples for the human brain. One possible answer is that good images lie well inside the classification region. Another possible answer is that these adversarial examples exist, but they are difficult to find. So again, this example of the boundary gives you the intuition. This point is close to the boundary. So some points on the other side within the admissible distance exist. But if I don't know the gradient, if I don't know the direction of the boundary, then if I move at random with very large probability, I will end up moving in this direction. Because when n goes to infinity, the current directions are a very small minority. So the fact that the adversarial examples exist is not enough. There must be a way to find them. And we have seen that if the function define the classifier is smooth enough, all I need to do is to align the attack to the gradient of the function. So if the function is smooth, I only need to align to the gradient. So the function must be smooth. In CNN, the functions are quite smooth because since I want the network to be robust, adding a small noise should not change much in general, the output. So uh, DNNs, we want them to be regular. We, add, we always add a regularization term. So DNNs are, we want them to be smooth. In addition, 
we have backpropagation. DNNs are built in such a way that if I know the network, computing the gradient is extremely easy. This is what is special with DNNs. And that's why they are so, 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 so skeptical. They are so prone to adversarial attacks because they tend to be smooth and because we have a good way to compute the gradient. Not only adversarial examples exist, they are easy to find. This is what's special with deep learning. And in fact, most adversarial attacks are based on gradient. Now it's not surprising after all I said. And in fact, most attacks against uh, DNN follow one of these formulation. Find X star such that the distortion is smaller than a certain quantity, which minimizes the output of the function phi. Or among all the points for which the function is negative, I want to pass from positive to negative, find the one who minimizes the distance. These are classical, I would say, optimization problems that can be solved by using gradient descent. And in fact, most attacks proposed so far are built around different variations of a gradient descent attack, which I'm reporting here. You have your initial point, initial image, have a step size, a stop condition, and you compute the gradient. So let me use another. You compute the gradient. Then you update your input image by going in the inverse direction of the gradient because you want to decrease, not to go up. T is what is called learning rate. Then if the distortion is too much, I stop. Here, yeah, mini, here I'm solving this one. I'm minimizing the function based on a condition on the distance. So if the distance is larger than a threshold, I stop. Otherwise I go on until the next step until I reach a local minimum, basically, because this means that the output of the function from one step to the other is close to zero. So this means that I reach a global or at least a local minimum, and then I return this. All the attacks are built around a scheme like this. There are variations, there are many variations, but most of them are built around this idea. Good, and now we can explain the examples. I take this dog, I carried out this algorithm, I find this perturbation, and I come out with a dog that now is classified as a cat. And it looks like the initial one. I can take a cat, compute this gradient, and come out with a cat which looks like the original, but it's not easy, eh? it's not equal. You see here, this part here is flat. While here is not flat, you have these kinds of stripes. This is the noise we have added, but it's MSC bounded. And this cat is now classified as a dog. I guess tomorrow, Manish, you will show examples of this. Will you? Uh, yeah. Tomorrow we are planning to use the CW attack and show all the attacks. Exactly. This is what we'll do tomorrow. Yeah. And this is the full box package, what we will use tomorrow. And uh, uh, not only, uh, the good thing is that not only adversarial attacks are easy to found, but all the researchers working on it came out with a full box, with a package of software where most of the adversarial attacks developed so far are implemented 
in Python so that you can go there, take one of those packages and apply the attack as you want. And you can verify that this is indeed what happens. Are we lost then? Is this the end of the world? <laughs> I mean, does this mean that we cannot apply, that you cannot use deep learning at all? No. First of all, tomorrow I will present you some defenses. But even without the defenses, the adversary has his own problem to solve. And now I will present some of these problems. I, I will skip this. So suppose I want to apply adversarial examples in the wild. I want to exploit all this theory, all this, I want to exploit this weakness of deep learning architectures to come out with an adversarial example working in the real world. I want to apply this in practice. I have to face a lot of problems. First, the perfect knowledge assumption may not work. I could keep my network secret. Then uh, I don't know the network exactly. Maybe I know a lot, but I cannot compute this gradient exactly because I don't know the network. So how can I apply these attacks if I do not have a perfect knowledge of the network? In addition, I need some degree of robustness. For instance, suppose I take an image, I have the adversarial attack. This perturbation is very, very, very small. But then suppose I apply JPEG compression. I want to compress my image. Then uh, maybe the perturbation will disappear. So in practice, the attack must work also when the image is modified a little bit. Because for instance, I want to represent the image not with floating point numbers, but with integers. So I have rounding here. I may apply compression and other stuff. Then to cope with the lack of knowledge, I have to apply transferability. I do not have the model. I will apply my attack to a model, which is my best guess of the model that I want to attack, and then hope well, that the attack I is unstoppable. In addition, sometimes I may want to implement the attack in the physical domain, because I mean, I want to, to use this to fool a self-driving car, and the self-driving car is not fed by digital images. It's fed by a camera looking at the outside world. So we want to apply this in a physical domain. These three things, robustness, transferability, and necessity to apply the attack in the physical domain raises some problems to the attacker. And hence, implementing one of such attacks in the real world hmm, is not so obvious. And I will go through some of these problems now. I hope I will be able to finish today. If it is too long, I can stop at a certain point and continue tomorrow, even because uh, my lecture for tomorrow is a little bit shorter. And today I had to introduce uh, the general framework and then analyze the attacks. Tomorrow I have only defenses, so if I'm not able to finish these slides today, I can conclude tomorrow. Let's see where I go. First of all, robustness again, post-processing. Let us consider this example um, here, because you will see tomorrow with Manish that when you apply the full box or the Carlinian Wagner attack, you do this in the floating point domain. The image at the input of, uh, of the network is a floating point number in the I0, in the zero, one to the n hypercube. 
So your perturbation will be very small in floating point. But real images are not floating point images. Once you have your attack image, maybe you want to transform this in PNG or the no, or bitmap, BMP, or any other format. In that case, pixels do not live in the floating point world. Pixels live in integer number. They stay into the zero, they stay into the if I want to be formal, they stay into the zero. Two five five intersected with with, uh, with natural numbers. All of these raised to the n. To make things easier, you live on a quantized lattice. So suppose you have this, this image x floating point. You find the closest point outside the boundary here. There is no guarantee that this will be a floating, that this will be an integer pixel image. So if you take this and you put this in PNG or bitmap, what will happen is that will you approximate each pixel values to the closest integer value. So what you do, you take the zero one interval, multiply by 255, and then you apply rounding. And you do this for all the pixels. So it is very possible that the closest integer image is again inside the blue region. You went out, but after quantization, the first quantized point could be again inside the blue region. And then, uh, no way, the attack disappears after you apply integer quantization. If you think about JPEG compression, this is even more true because in JPEG compression, you quantize the image in the DCT domain and you apply a very strong quantization because there you want to compress the image. So if this is true for integer quantization, this is even more true for JPEG compression. And in fact, I will, I will say more about this tomorrow. This property is sometimes used as a way to defend against adversarial attacks. And these people say, if I take an image and apply JPEG compression or integer quantization, but say JPEG compression, then visually the image appears the same. This is a cat after JPEG compression, the cat is still a cat. If the network is good enough, the network will still be able to recognize a cat even after JPEG compression. But JPEG compression may remove the perturbation introduced by the attack. <clears throat> so what? In this paper, they are using a practical defense, they call this vaccination, uh, against adversarial attack by applying JPEG compression. Before running the network, they simply apply JPEG compression. And they found that in most of the cases, the attack disappears. There is a counter countermeasure. I will talk about this tomorrow. But uh, this property has always been used as a defensive. So let us see what happens. <clears throat> Suppose you apply a standard attack in full box. You will, you will see this tomorrow. Very often, you are able to attack an image by having a very extremely large peak signal to noise ratio. The quality of the attack image is absolutely wonderful. You don't see anything. Sometimes, for instance, the PSNR between the original image and the image after the full box attacks is so large as 60 dBs. I've seen attacks with 70 dBs sometimes. This is absolutely useless. When I see a paper saying that they're able to attack an image 
with 60 or even 70 dBs of PSNR, I say, well, interesting, but this attack is useless. Why? What does 60 dBs mean? 60 dBs means that 10 log 10 to 155 divided by the mean square error is equal to 60. This means that the MSC is, you do some computation here. This means that the mean square error is around 0 0.06. Huh? When you bring this to the 255 domain. This is square, if you remove the squaring, so if you take the square root of this, this means that the perturbation is in the order of 0 0.25. 0 0.25 is smaller than the integer rounding error. If you take any integer value, the you norm, know, 33, and you add or remove 0 0.25, and then you round it, you will end up to 33 again. So be careful. If the quality of your attacked image is too much, if the perturbation is too small, this perturbation will disappear when you save your image into an integer format. Good? So be careful. And in fact, in this paper, by Benedetta Tondi, a collaborator of mine. Uh, she developed an attack that works exactly in the integer domain. Uh, it is possible to develop attacks that do not work in the floating point realm, but work in the integer domain. In that case, you make sure that your perturbation is at least one. In this case, uh, quantization does not make any problem. JPEG compression may, but integer quantization doesn't. So be careful. Huh? If you are an attacker, make sure that your attack is strong enough to survive this very simple processing. Integer approximation, JPEG compression, and this kind of stuff. Good. And then suppose you want to carry out an attack in the real world. This is even more challenging, but still possible. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Why this is even more challenging? Because you attack your network and you come out with a digital image. If you feed this image to a CNN, you have an error. Good. But then you want to apply this in the digital world. So you have a digital image. You have to at least print it on a traffic sign, on the glasses, on the back of a turtle, wherever you want. But you have to print it. And then the real world system will scan it again with a camera. So whenever you want to plan an attack in the physical domain, your attack image must undergo a digital to analog conversion followed by an analog to digital back conversion. And this is much worse than JPEG. This is much worse than integer quantization. The transformation that you apply here can be very bad and is not guaranteed at all that your attack will survive this double digital to analog and analog to digital passage. You must make sure that this is the case. That's why there were some papers developing proper ways to apply attacks strong enough to work in the real world. And the basic tool is this expectation of a transformation attack. What's that? Suppose T is 
and geometric transformation for me. Because one of the transformation you have when you, when you print an image and you scan it again, is that your camera will have a different perspective. So very often what you get is a geometrically transformed image. You have perspective, have a little bit of rotation, you may have cropping, you may have resizing. Does the adversarial example survive these geometric transformations? Usually it doesn't. So what you do? You look for rho, rho here is Z, is the perturbation, such that when it is added to the image I, and this adversarial image undergoes a certain perturbation T, maybe a geometric transformation. And when this is applied to your network phi, this quantity is as small as possible. Averaged over all possible transformations. So in practice, you are trying to get an adversary example that works not only for one single image, but for all or as many as possible transform image over a wide set of transformations T. How do you do that? Rather than computing The graph, so suppose your output is phi as usual. Rather than trying to minimize phi, you minimize the sum of phi over, over many transform version of the input image plus a perturbation. And you do, you minimize this over Z such that the normal Z is smaller than a certain quantity. Since this new objective function is linear in I, then you can compute the gradient of this as the sum of the gradients of the single files. And then it will be more difficult, but you can find the perturbation that on the average is able to lower your output on the range of images that are transformed version of your attack image. If these transformations can model well the analog to digital, sorry, can model well the digital to analog and analog to digital transformation, then ensuring that your attack works in this can also work in practice. This is how these adversarial examples with the glasses, with these stops and this turtle were made. But now the attack is much stronger because you need to be robust to the entire set of transformations. And in fact, the attack now is very visible. These glasses are visible. This traffic sign is corrupted. We can see that this is corrupted. The back and uh, these signs on the back of the turtle are visible. So, you can apply your attack in the physical domain by using this expectation over transformation strategy. The price to pay is that find the attack will take a lot more time and the attack will be by far more visible. And so if you try to, if you try to pass the border of your country, with these glasses in front, maybe you can fool the network 
by the policeman in front of you will say, why do we have these strange glasses? Or if you try to uh, put this kind of noise on a traffic sign, somebody in the city can see that this traffic sign has something strange and then can try to clean it. So hmm, this is not so obvious. Of course, in the biometric case, you can fool a system that is non-attended, like a cell phone, for instance. But in general, uh, the price you pay to have an attack in the real world is not so small. Good. And I have an example here because I've been working myself with my group in this area regarding the biometric recognition system for anti-spoofing. So we'll go into the details of this system that we had developed in my laboratory. But before the, to show how difficult it is to implement an attack in the real world. But before doing that, if you have questions here, tell me. Question, I go. So this is something I developed in my, in my lab. So it's a pleasure for me to explain it. So, you know, the spoofing attack in biometric system. What is a spoofing attack? Spoofing attack is what I show here. Suppose I want to enter a phone and you have a face recognition system to protect your phone. And suppose that the owner of this phone is this man. I'm not this man. I have a picture of this man. What I can do is that I can show the picture on my screen or print it with a printer. And then I frame the picture with my phone. And then I have a face recognition system that sees this man in front of the camera and says, well, you can enter. This kind of attack is called a spoofing attack. Or in particular, a rebroadcast attack. Good. Well, in order to cope with this kind of attacks, you need an anti-spoofing module. So you need the module that given this picture, the module can tell if this picture comes from a living person in front of you, or it comes from a monitor or from a piece of paper is a kind of liveness detection uh, scheme. So you want to equip your system with this anti-spoofing module. So your end-to-end -to -end -to system will be like this. You have the person in front, the camera takes your image, you have a face detector to make sure that what you have in front of you is a face, then have a spoof detector guaranteeing that what you have in front of you is a living person. And then you have the face recognition. These two steps in front are there to ensure that the face recognition works on faces and not on noise as I've shown in the previous slide. I cannot ask to a face recognition if I don't know a house is Mr. Barney or not, or if a completely noisy image, it's me or not. The face recognition must work on faces. That's why I need the face detection at the beginning. And then there is this spoof detection. It's to call the anti-spoofing block. Good. Well, not surprisingly, uh, the best anti-spoofing blocks developed so far are built by using CNNs. 
until a few years ago, there were many clever model-based systems for spoofing detection. Now, with the deep learning revolution, all these steps are usually made by CNNs. Here, I care about the spoofing detector. Great. So what I want to do here is the following. I know that this spoofing detector, I know it, I know everything about the spoofing detector. So I have a perfect knowledge case. And I know that the spoofing detector is weak, is vulnerable to adversarial examples. So I say, great, I am a very clever attacker. I know how to get around the spoofing detector because I know how to generate adversarial examples for this spoofing detector. Good, easier said than done. Because if you want to do that, you have to face many problems and I will tell you which problems you have. These are the kind of problems that an attacker must face with. First of all, your attack image must be end to end successful. Not only the attacked image should fool the spoofing detector. The face in it should be recognized as a face and the face in it should be recognized as the victim of the attack. I cannot modify this man too much. Otherwise, the system, maybe the spoofing detector will not work, but the system will not recognize the person anymore. So the attack cannot be too strong. Otherwise, the face detector and the face recognition modules will not work anymore. OK, we uh, started this problem in this paper published uh, uh, two years ago. And I will tell some other problems that I have to face with. So this is the system. Huh? OK, let me take another color. So what does happen? The normal situation, you have a living person. The living person goes in front of the camera. I take a digital picture. Then there is the face recognition. And then there is the spoofing detector. But since this is a real person in front of me, I say that this is a real image and this picture can go to the face recognition part. Now, what could I do as an attacker? I could take this digital picture. I can find the picture of this person somewhere on the internet. I can display it in a monitor. And this is a digital to analog conversion. And this will be a zero effort spoofing photo. The camera will frame this picture on the monitor, and I will get another spoof image, which is digital to analog, analog to digital. There's no attack here. I just printed the image for the moment. And then the spoofing detector works very well, and we recognize that this image does not come from a living person, and then I will say, stop. There's a spoofing attack here. Good. So far, this is the standard rebroadcast attack that is stopped by the spoofing detector. Now I am a clever attacker and want to use adversarial examples to do this. Then what should I do? I must try to obtain this image. So what do I do? I mount the spoofing attack. I take the image of the victim on the network, I print it, and I rescan it by means of a camera that is as close as possible to the camera of the system that I want to uh, fool. I need this because I cannot apply the attack to the digital photo, to the original digital photo. Because the digital original photo very likely has been taken from the living person. So if I feed this photo 
to the spoofing detector, there's no need to attack it. This is already a good picture. I want to attack a picture after that the picture has been printed and scanned back. So I need to attack this image. Good, but I can do it. I can find this original image here. I print it, I scan it, and I have the image to be attacked. At this point, I know everything about the spoofing detector. So I am putting myself in a very positive situation. Still, the attack is different. Now what do I do? I apply an adversarial attack. Maybe by using Carlinian Wagner or by using FGSM or any gradient based attack. Here, I have a digital adversarial example. I know that if I feed this directly to the spoofing detector, the spoofing detector will fail. Good. Mm. But I cannot do it because I cannot access this phone inside. I, I, I must feed my image through the external camera. So what I have to do is that I have to take this adversarial image, print it, and this is the printed version, and feed my system with this printed image. So I am applying a new digital to analog, analog to digital conversion to the attacked image. In a sense, this image has been rebroadcasted twice. And in the middle, I have the adversarial attack. What will the spoofing detector do here? I don't know. First of all, my adversarial perturbation could disappear because of the rebroadcast. Second, and this is even more challenging, suppose that your anti-spoofing detector looks at some artifacts introduced by the print and scan process. Even if these artifacts are removed by the attack, when I rebroadcast the attacked image, I will reintroduce again these artifacts. And then there is no attack here. So even if the attack is able to cancel out the rebroadcast traces, these rebroadcast traces will be introduced back during this conversion. And maybe the adversarial, the spoofing detector will still work. In a sense, in this particular application, which is very tricky, the adversarial attack must work in a preemptive way so that we can avoid that rebroadcasting nullifies the attack. <clears throat> this is a particular property that we need to satisfy for to, to fool a spoofing detector. Hmm. Not easy at all. We started this problem and to solve this in this way. Uh, we trained, I mean, we looked for the attack solving this additional uh, minimization problem. So rather than this is similar to the to the expected over transformation attack. What I do? Rho is the perturbation. So we want to minimize rho in such a way, first of all. First of all. That 
If applied the phase detector CNN, this is the CNN for phase detection. So such that the phase detector tells you one. So ensuring that the phase detector still works. This is a constraint. Also, I want the phase recognition part outputs the target person. So this additional constraint, it ensures that the face is recognized as the victim of the attack. Subject to, the, to these constraints, and so what I have below guarantees me that this is an end-to-end -end attack. Subject to this constraint, what I do is the following. I is the fee. Um, the phi I had before is a different notation. IS is the image after the first rebroadcast. Rho is the perturbation. I apply a transformation R. R is the T I had before. I apply this transformation and then apply my anti spoofing function. This is phi S. Sorry. And this is the loss. Of phi s, okay. So what I want is that if I apply phi to a geometrically and not only geometrically transformed image after perturbation, the loss with respect to the target uh, class is maximized or minimized depends on the sign. So this could be the cross entropy, you could know something like that. So I want that after application of the, of the attack, after geometric transformation, the output of the network does not match with the target source, or it matches the target source, depend whether T is the target or the source classes. And I want to do this by averaging over all transformation R in a set of transformation big R. R, the big R models, the geometric and radiometric distortions introduced by the rebroadcast and reacquisition process. And I want to do this by also keeping the distortion limited. Otherwise the image is too bad and this too will never work. Solving this problem is not obvious, but you can do it. And this is and this is what we did. And these are the results we got. First of all, what kind of transformations did we use? The transformation should mimic the rebroadcast process. So we introduced rotation, shearing, scaling, translation into this range, and perspective. And then also some radiometric changes because when uh, the monitor has different lights, the light in the, in, the, in the room may be different and many other things. So we have a brightness change, a random brightness change, a random contrast change, random Gaussian blurring with certain standard deviation and some changes of the hue and saturation colors of the image. So, this expectation over transformation now is really vast. The number of transformation is really big. And these are the results we got. Huh? So look at this. First of all, the images. These are the images after the initial rebroadcast. No other serial examples. If I feed the CNN anti spoofing with these images, the Entire spoofing system will say these are spoofed. No way. Good. I can attack these images. So to fool the entire spoofing system. And we did this with many ways. BAM, FGSM, GA, IGSA, IGA. These are all attacks in the full box package.
This is the PSNR after the attack. Mm, pretty low, by the way. The attack success rate in the digital domain, that is without the, the digital to analog and analog to digital conversions is very large. We were able to attack almost all the images with 100% for most of the case. But after the second rebroadcast, the success rate, this ASR is the attack success rate. After, after we go in the physical domain, the success rate decreases a lot, 20%, 11%, 15%. The rebroadcast process nullifies the effort of the attack. And this is what we did when, when we applied this uh, optimization here. Again, the PSNR decreases a little bit. The success rate in the digital domain is perfect. In the physical domain, we raise from 20% to almost 80% here, or nevertheless, larger than 70%. And in all cases, we were able to pass the face detector and the face recognition steps. You may think that this is small, but it's not. Because suppose the attacker can cure the, the system three times. I tried three times. I have three of these attacked images. And trying to enter this phone, I have three attempts. After three, the system is blocked. Well, with this success rate, if I can cure the system three times, the success rate jumps to about 95%. Because at least one time out of three will work. So the attack is very effective. And these are the images after the new attack. You see, the, the quality is not as good as before, but still, the faces can be recognized as faces and the persons can be recognized. And in fact, the face recognition system works. And these are after the physical domain attack. I find this to be very interesting. And uh, it tells that indeed adversarial attacks can be implemented in the real world, but it's not obvious at all. We have to, we have to work a lot before this could work. We have to model the entire system carefully. We had to come out with a new loss function and we had to uh, come out with a way of approximating the physical transformation. And then we had to decrease the PSNR at a certain point. And here, we were working under the full knowledge assumption. I assume that they know perfectly the CNN. If I don't, everything is even more difficult. We didn't work it out already. So moving this in a limited knowledge scenario and make it work in real life, hmm, indeed. Adversarial examples are there, are possible, are a threat, but the attacker has his own trouble to solve. Other troubles, as I told, comes when I do not have a perfect knowledge because these are the problems that I have to face with when I want the attack to be robust. I want the attack to go in the physical domain. What does happen? When I do not even have a perfect knowledge, this is for tomorrow, I guess, because now it's too late. Indeed, tomorrow I have less things to say for the defense. And so I can skip this last part and leave this for tomorrow. Otherwise, it's too much today. Is this okay, Manish, if I leave this for tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. But we have five minutes. So if you have any questions, I think today was a little bit 
easier to understand, still, still quite deep, but I mean, there's a little bit less math today. So maybe oh, you can get more advantage out of it. Bernie, I have one question. Sure, go. As you said that in the case of full knowledge, uh, even designing attack is not so easy. No, so, possible, but not so easy. Not so easy. And in the case of we attackers have the partial knowledge of the system or CNN, or they don't have the knowledge of the CNN architecture. In that case, it becomes even too difficult. Yes, but I mean, not, not impossible, I would say, but- Not impossible, but it's very difficult. It even, is more difficult. So attackers have may more challenge rather than, can I say, to the defender. So then the, tomorrow what you are going to discuss about how to defend. I will, I will also discuss how to defend, exactly. Yes. But I, I mean, the idea is that we need to study defenses because in security oriented applications, the attacker can be very powerful. We can have a very good enemy in front of us. So, well, in security oriented applications, our enemies can be very motivated, can be even countries, can be government organizations. So even if the attacks are difficult, well, they can manage it. Okay. So but we should not panic. The idea is not, it's not that tomorrow, everybody will put these attacks in place and all our DNS will fail and will not work anymore. This is not so obvious. So we it need is a danger. Huh? And we need to study this. So, but I mean, don't panic. I mean, it, it, it's not so easy. It's not that everybody in the world can come out, take the full box package and implement one of these attacks. Yes. You need some knowledge to do it and you need to work it. Then you can make it. Okay. But I mean, I mean, the point here is that life is not easy, not even for the attacker. Huh? Yes, yes. That's for the defender is worse, but for the attacker is not easy as well. So we have to look for those security related problems, basically where we need to design a model. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I mean, rather than coming out with a new attack where you can save, uh, I mean, 0.1% uh, uh, from the Carlin and Wagner attack on that, I would rather suggest to try to make this work in practice, which, uh, I mean, it can teach you a lot. And then defending against the practical attacks can be a little bit easier because if you go in the digital domain, the attacker knows everything. Uh, maybe it's really impossible to defend against attacks. You've seen these, uh, these speculations about the existence of adversarial attacks that may, they maybe always exist. So maybe it's even, it's interesting from a machine learning theory point of view, because this is a very interesting problem. But for real life, uh, we should try to defend against this kind of stuff, which is still you need a defense, but the defense may, may be a little bit easier than in the digital domain. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, any other questions from participants? You'd like to take it? I think it is the it's like there are no more questions. So if I can just summarize quickly, uh, the uh, like whatever was uh, told today was from the attacker's point of view. So we had a brief summary of from the perfect knowledge part. So we, uh, although it was constrained to some assumptions uh, because the field is very large and a few examples we could see uh, where we could see some results on his own. Uh, a laboratory work uh, which was done and you can also here yeah, show two things one was with regard to the digital world and the other one is with, with regard to the physical world so with this i think uh, the attack part is over so we would like to thank professor bernie for joining today and as he has told tomorrow it would be same time that he would be jo uh, joining but his lecture would be a little bit shorter and he would be talking about the rest of the attack and the possible defenses against that yes, so, so <laughs> So maybe in the end it will not be so shorter because I have something left from today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think we'll take it off today and tomorrow we meet in the morning India time with regard to the Cagni attack and the full box software which we'll try to do in collab sessions and post that uh, our 
India lunch session, we will try to have Professor Bernie with us, with the rest of his part. So with this, I think I, I thank you, sir, for being there and namaste. Okay, namaste to you as well. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye.